I work a very early morning schedule at my job. I go in at 2 in the morning and work until noon, 4 days a week. I used to sleep in until about maybe 7 o'clock on my days off because of just how exhausting my schedule is. But recently, I found it easier to just wake up at my normal time at 1 o'clock in the morning every day of the week. It's not easy, but I get paid good money at my job and waking up at the same time every day assures that I won't be exhausted all the time trying to balance my schedule out every week. I'm very disciplined though about my health and well-being, so I've always been a bit of a runner. I always try and get about 15 to 20 miles of running in every week. I've always preferred running outdoors rather than on a treadmill in some gym somewhere, but where I live, it can get a, a bit hot outside, so I've always ran earlier in the morning or late at night. Ever since getting my job, I've went for my runs at 2 o'clock in the morning on my days off. I actually find it very relaxing and I love the emptiness of the streets at night. The atmosphere provokes a lot of deep thoughts within me, which always makes my runs easier. Now, I'm a very tall and muscular guy, so I've never been too terrified of running into some creep at night on my runs. I also used to take karate when I was in high school, so I always feel as if I can defend myself if a situation of sorts ever presented itself. Basically, if someone ever tried to get tough with me, I'd be more scared for them than I would myself. However, my self-confidence and courage recently disappeared after encountering, well, whatever that thing was on one of my runs. A couple of months ago, I was on my morning run, running the same route as I always do. I was about two miles into a five mile run, meaning I was two miles away from home. I always run on the outskirts of the giant park that borders the north side of my town. It's filled with trees and bushes and a lot of animals, so it isn't uncommon to have some encounters with badgers or possums or birds at night, and I've grown used to all of the weird noises that I hear coming from the trees. However, this night was different. The oddest thing was that I didn't hear anything out of the ordinary while running along the path next to the park, but I got this deep sort of dreadful feeling in my stomach. I'd never felt anything like it before. Fear arose within me and I had no idea why. I guess my sixth sense kicked in that night or something. I didn't know what I was feeling or even thinking really. I just knew that I had to get out of there as fast as I could. My jog turned into a run which then turned into a sprint. My senses knew that I was being followed by someone or something. I felt the leaves crumbling at my feet with each step that I took. I didn't even think about where I was running or where I was heading as long as I got out of there. I wanted to look behind me just to know if I was actually running from something or if I was just being paranoid. But my body just wouldn't let me look. I was too afraid to know the truth, I guess. The dread and the fear only began to grow within me too. Even after running for a good couple of minutes, I still didn't feel safe. Suddenly, too, I found myself trying to shout and yell for help, but I couldn't. I couldn't even make a sound. I was hardly even breathing. My vocals seemed to be drowning in my despair, and I was about out of breath at this point, so I made the mistake of turning around in hopes to find myself alone with no one chasing me. But as I turned around, my foot kicked into a rock sticking out of the ground, and I fell to my face. In fear, I looked behind me. In fear, I stood up and prepared myself for whatever came my way. My flight reactions were about to turn into fight reactions, I think. I clenched my fists and stood up straight, making myself appear as threatening as I could. But surprisingly, I, I found myself alone. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. Nothing. Why would I be so afraid, though? What was I running from? Was I that paranoid? I had a hard time believing that this was all my imagination, but that's what my eyes were saying because nobody was there. Nothing was there. I felt relief, I guess, and I began to slow walk home on a bit of a limp trying to catch my breath. I was farther from home now than I was before, and the only way back home from where I was was back on that path next to the park where I had just come from. I decided this time to walk directly through the park to avoid the same path that I was just on instead. I soon regretted this decision, however. I had never walked through the park at night before, so I had no idea that there were no lights on this path. 
In fact, it was pitch black, the darkest black that I'd ever seen all around. But I couldn't turn back now. I had to get home and I wanted to put all of this behind me. I kept putting one foot in front of the other and only looked forward. As long as I felt the pavement below me, I knew that I was going in the right direction. Suddenly though, I felt my stomach drop yet again. That same feeling and the same fear grew within me. This wasn't the exact same though. I knew that I was in real danger and it wasn't just paranoia this time because this time I saw something and it's weird. Bear with me here as I try to explain this. In this pitch darkness, the darkest black that I had ever seen, I saw something. How is hard to explain though, but I saw this figure moving in front of me and it was darker than the black night. The deepest, darkest thing that I had ever seen in my life was moving toward me on a path that I was walking on. This time, this time I didn't fight, I didn't run, I completely froze, dead in my tracks. I couldn't make myself move, I tried but I was just completely paralyzed. I had to watch the darkness of whatever this thing was approach me. The dark black of this thing grew closer and closer until everything was darker than black around me. I felt immersed in darkness all of a sudden. I opened my mouth to make a sound and this time I actually could. I let out a fearful cry and closed my eyes and I felt nothing. I can't explain this feeling but I just felt nothing. I honestly thought for a moment that I was dead but the sounds of birds chirping slowly faded in. Too afraid to open my eyes I continued to listen to the chirping of the birds and in the distance I could even hear the voices of people. I felt a soft breeze touch my nose and I finally worked up the courage to open my eyes and now it was daytime and the morning dew covered me. I was laying in the park on the path right where I was, well, attacked or whatever by this thing. But how could it be morning already? A few seconds ago I was just in the darkness of these woods and all of a sudden it was daylight? Whatever the case, I felt completely exhausted and confused and I headed for home without question. I am still confused about this experience every day that I think about it. I have never slept walk in my life that I know of or have had any other occurrences like this ever since. I still can't explain what happened to me that night but it's safe to say that I don't run at 2 in the morning any longer. Several months ago, I uh, had a bit too much to drink with some friends one night. I arrived back to my car at around 12 in the morning and I decided that I was not in any condition to drive. I grabbed whatever blankets and jackets that I had, curled up in the back seat and I fell asleep. At around 4 in the morning though, I woke up sort of hungover but much more sober than before. I reached to the front and started my car to warm it up. As I sat down and looked out the rear window, I saw a man. He was wearing a dark hoodie with a, a red backpack on. He was standing under a streetlight, just staring at me from the middle of the parking lot. I, I was confused. It, it was dark and I thought that I was just seeing things at first. But then he started walking towards my car. I have never, ever jumped in that driver's seat with such swiftness in my life. I swear my heart felt like it stopped too. He proceeded to stop and just stood there watching me drive away and I thought that I caught a glimpse of something as shiny in his hand but it still makes me feel uneasy to this day. I like to believe that he was just watching me sleep but needless to say I will not be sleeping in my car ever again. So this is my last resort because I've looked on a bunch of forums, I've looked all over the internet but I don't see much in terms of results. I've read that it could possibly be an incubus but that just sounds a little too uh, mythical to me I guess. I've never been a paranormal believer or a religious person but I do respect it because of my grandmother. She believes heavily in this stuff and even has CDs full of supposed captures of demons and angels and whatnot. 
Lots of orbs, mysterious figures and the like. I admit too that they are a little bit strange. She's had them looked at but was told to stop taking pictures because there was apparently something following her and it was not a good being. She also reports experiences where she's seen my great grandma and grandpa. My aunt, her daughter who has lived with her, confirmed some of her own experiences as well. The four were very close when my great grandparents were alive. And well, now I live with my grandma, but this thing has me on the fence of belief, I'll, I'll tell you that much. I say on the fence though because truly I could be just going insane. I don't know. I don't want it to be real to be honest. The only mental problems I've ever had though is depression and anxiety, so there's that I guess. But my grandma does have a prescription of schizophrenia that she'd stopped taking a while ago, but it's the cleanly worried about mess kind of schizophrenia. But my aunt is mentally stable is what I'm getting at. Never took a drug. I have also been having dreams of a, a sexual nature. I rarely remember dreams, but they've been vivid recently and also one where I was being told some type of secret and that if I told anyone I was done for or, or dead or something by a, a vague blonde man in robes. He was bringing me in to show me something and I blurly remember some type of necklace with an eye symbol on it. But the weirdest thing is that every second of the day I, I feel something near me or touching me inappropriately. I work from home too so I have to really focus and it really gets to me. I've prayed, I've bought religious candles, put a pillow between my legs, put my hair up from my neck, worn tight clothing or no clothing at all, turned off all wind makers, closed windows, held my breath to stop making any moves, to check to see if I was just being paranoid, if it was a draft or just my clothing moving or something when I was breathing. But no, I feel it. I feel someone touching me sometimes and it's still here. I think I maybe accidentally called it one time as well. My boyfriend is on a navy boat underway currently so I've been more wanting for certain things lately and one night about a week ago it was particularly bad so I was doing a maintenance I guess you could call it and that's when it started. I let it happen because of obvious reasons but I was really confused and thought maybe I was just dreaming. I now go to sleep bundled up around my groin area. That makes it go away, but it wakes me up either way around two-ish or three-ish every time without fail, in which I'll be in completely different positions on the bed with whatever it is touching me. Whatever it is, I don't feel that it's evil. It just has a one-track mind, I guess. I tried talking to it once, and I know that sounds crazy, but it doesn't really respond. So I stopped talking to it entirely, ignored it for hours. Same thing though, it never leaves. Also, just on the touching stuff, it's not always sexual or anything, but there's like a caressing of my face, my back, my neck, or my legs sometimes. Sometimes it even seems to get angry with me or something and pinches my nose. Sometimes too I get a, a really odd pressure on my ear and it makes it ring a bit. Also, depending on the temperature in the room, it's been a, a very warm touch or a very cold touch. 50-50 really. I thought traditionally that their touch was only cold, or so I've been told, so this came as a real surprise to me. To be honest with you though, I, I really don't know what to believe about any of this. I sort of hope that I'm just sort of crazy now, I guess. Uh, I think I'm going to go and get an assessment, but I would just like some theories and possibly some help or something. Or do I need to be admitted into a psych ward? What do you guys think? Also, we stopped using gas for heating, so it's not hallucinations from a gas leak or anything, and it's a brand new tank as well. Again, I just don't know what this is. I don't know if it's a ghost, if it's just all in my mind, or maybe if it's something evil. A couple of years ago, my buddy and I were bored one afternoon and decided to explore an abandoned house that I'd spotted earlier that week when I was out on a drive. We live in a town that is mostly suburbs, but if you drive five minutes north, it's all country roads, farmland, forest, etc. The abandoned house that I spotted was in the middle of a field. 
there wasn't a paved road or gravel driveway that led up to it. So we parked as close as we could on the side of the road and walked through the tall grass to reach it. The house looked pretty old, most likely built in the early 1900s. There were plants engulfing the entire home and part of the roof was missing from what looked like fire damage. It had obviously been abandoned for some time at this point. But my friend told me that he was going to hang back when we came close to the house. He just couldn't shake the feeling that something was off and said that he was getting bad vibes. I, though, decided to keep going. But when I reached the house, I looked in through the windows and saw lots of weather damage and signs of neglect. The door, however, was locked. I walked around the perimeter of the house and found a cellar door, unlocked. I entered and slowly started walking down an old wooden staircase. I got about halfway down and squinted, waiting for my eyes to adjust to the darkness. The only light source was the sunlight coming in from the open cellar door, and it was full of old belongings, furniture and junk. But then, in the far right corner, I saw what looked like a figure standing in the darkness facing me. My stomach sank. It was a tall person just standing there, straight, with their arms at their side. I couldn't make out what they were wearing or any facial features. I stood there for a few seconds staring back at them in shock. I thought it had to be my mind playing tricks on me at first, so I squinted harder trying to make out if what I was seeing was actually a tall figure, when suddenly it moved slightly and made a deep grunting sound. At that, I panicked and I ran up the stairs as fast as I could. When my friend saw the look on my face when I exited the basement, he started running towards the car. He said that it looked like I'd seen a ghost or something. When we drove away, I kept looking back to see if we were being followed or anything, but nobody was there. This happened three nights ago, and I'm still going crazy trying to figure this out. So I just moved into a new apartment one month ago and I'm still unpacking and settling in. I've been using my parents' address as my mailing address, who live a few towns over, like 20 minutes away, all of my life. Three nights ago, my parents called me at 2am, freaked out and proceed to tell me this story. So apparently, at 1 in the morning, someone starts banging on their front door and repeatedly ringing their doorbell. My stepdad walks downstairs and opens the door, leaving the front glass door closed and locked. And there was a man standing outside who looked to be in his 30s with a black hoodie on with the hood pulled up around his face. He didn't have any distinguishing facial features, facial hair or tattoos or anything. The only thing my stepdad said was that he looked to be Hispanic perhaps. Neither my stepdad or my mother, who was watching the whole thing out of a window, recognized this guy. The man then says... Oh, uh, I'm sorry to bother you, but I'm looking for... And he gives my full name. My stepdad plays dumb and says, who? The man proceeds to state my full name again and says that my boyfriend is worried because I didn't come home that night. He claims to be a friend of my boyfriend and tells my stepdad that they're both out looking for me, worried because I didn't show up at home. I don't have a boyfriend... I live by myself and with my three dogs and haven't been in a relationship in like the last five to six months. But here's the really weird part. So my stepdad asks the guy what boyfriend he was talking about and the man tells him the name of the boyfriend that I had when I was in 10th grade, nearly 20 years ago. My boyfriend in the 10th grade has a very, very unique Italian name. I've never met anyone with a full name even close to his. He says my high school boyfriend's name a few more times to ensure my stepdad heard him and repeats that they are very worried about me. And he asks, is my stepdad sure that I'm not inside? At this point, my stepdad is weirded out and closes and locks the door in his face. But the man doesn't leave. He lingers in the front of my parents' house for the next 10 minutes, smoking cigarettes and talking on the phone. Finally, my parents call the cops. About five minutes before the cops arrive, the man walks down to the dead end on their block and drives away in a, a silver car. My stepdad was unable to get the license plate, but my parents file a police report and nothing else happens. After I hear this story though, I'm going nuts over the weird details. Like, how would someone know who I dated nearly 20 years ago and what would the motive be of making up a story that included that weird detail about my past? I've not had contact with the 10th grade boyfriend in over a decade now. 
Yesterday, though, I decide to message him on Facebook to see if he has any insight. I tell him the whole story, and he's just as confused as I am and claims to have no part in it. I'm at a bit of a loss at this point. I'm also really freaked out that some strange man is going through that much trouble at 1am to look for me. Any insights or ideas would be greatly appreciated. And no, nothing else weird has happened since then. Like I said, I have no idea what to think about this, but something tells me that it's not good. So I, a 41-year-old female, have had a sleep condition called REM sleep behavior disorder that causes me to occasionally continue dreaming after part of my brain has woken up. So I can look around my room and see things that are just not there. This is common enough for me that after the initial panic wears off, I get over it pretty quickly. That is, until the night my partner at the time saw it too. So I woke up in my bed flat on my back. Above me was a solid black humanoid creature with smooth features, long, thin limbs. Its mouth was open, very close to mine. I felt like it was studying me, maybe. My heart was racing, as it always is when I have these sleep disturbances. I jolted in fear, and the thing vanished. I took some big, deep breaths and thought to myself how messed up that episode was. It felt really real. I felt its curiosity and its expression, and... It was so close to my face that it was almost touching me. My dreams are usually vivid, but man, this was different. I felt my heart, which was beating like crazy, and took another breath to help slow it down. Then my partner in the bed beside me said, Did you see that too? I hadn't yet said anything out loud at that point, except for gasping for air, so I asked him what he saw. He said that he saw a black creature leaning over me. He said that it skittled down to the foot of the bed and over the edge. He said that it was a, a shadow person or something like it. I never heard of them, but I was freaking out at this point and turned on all the lights. I made him go look under the bed and there was nothing there. He was into supernatural stuff. I never was, and other than this event, I still am not. I prefer science, I guess. I, I like things that I can measure and explain. But this experience, him seeing something that I rationalized in my mind as a dream gone bad, just did not line up with my worldview. I didn't sleep that night. Everything just sort of buzzed with creepy energy and I wasn't having it. I mean, where did this thing go? Where the heck did it come from in the first place? What was it doing on my bed? Why was it looking so intensely at me? I have a son too and at the time he was about 14. I didn't tell him what I saw for obvious reasons. But when he was two, he actually had a fever that induced a seizure at one point. It was a, a terrible experience for me, more than him I guess, but he was back to normal within maybe a few hours and I was traumatized for years. But any time that he got a fever after that, he tended to become disorientated and easily confused. So he developed a fever in the night. I don't even remember what it was from and I didn't know about it until the morning. He tells me, shaken, that he had a horrible, horrible night sleeping. He said that he felt like something was in the room all night. He told me that he saw a creature, a little black guy in his room. Every time that he opened his eyes, it would sort of back off, but when he closed them, it would always come closer. He said that it happened all night and he barely slept. It's important to note, too, that I'm not into supernatural things at all. I don't really believe it in, in fact. Like I said, I sort of lean into science, but when my son told me this story, I leaned into whatever I could to clear out space of this unwanted guest. A friend recommended that I contact an elder from a local First Nations community and asked if she could help us. She came and did a ceremonial cleansing and blessing of our home and family as well and asked the ancient spirits to protect us and keep us safe. After that, we didn't see the shadow person again. I still cannot explain what happened that night. The elder said that there was a portal open near the center of our home, apparently, and she politely asked the being to leave, and I don't know, I, I guess it did. We eventually moved out of that house, and to be honest, uh, I really don't miss it.
When I was younger, 18 to 24 years old, I worked at my family's trucking company. It was a small operation with around 17 trucks. I did the dock compliance and log auditing. One Friday as I was preparing to go home, I was informed that they had decided to open a warehouse as well and I would be responsible for setting it up and the daily operations. They handed me a set of keys for the building and an address to report to on Monday. Guessing being the youngest member of the family working there meant I was the first one to get moved around to other jobs. So, Monday comes and I show up to the building at 8 in the morning. It was an old metal manufacturing building that was built in the 60s. The company that originally built and occupied the building had closed years ago and the new owner had divided the building into 50 foot wide by 200 foot long sections that each had a long front door, a rear door with steps, dock door and plate and two small bathrooms built in the front left corner of the unit. After we had been open for a couple of weeks, they built a small office in the right corner of our unit so that I could have a space to set up a computer for inventory control and invoicing. As this was a small warehouse operation, I was the only employee. When we needed something shipped out to one of our customers, they would send our local delivery driver over with a tractor, a sort of trailer thing, to deliver the product. And at first, everything was good. I would show up and wait for orders to come in and then pull the pallets and let dispatch know that I needed the driver to bring the tractor trailer and make a delivery. It was a pretty boring job if I'm being honest as I was the only one there really. One day though after we had been open for about six months I was rotating pallets in the aisle and as I backed out of an aisle with the forklift I saw an old man out of the corner of my eye. As I was supposed to be the only person in the warehouse and I was certain all the doors were locked, I turned to cuss out whoever was standing there, but when I turned, there was nobody there. I chalked it up to my imagination and I went on about my business. It was probably two weeks before I saw the old man again, I think. I was getting pallets pulled for an order and I was backing out of the aisle and I saw him again out of the corner of my eye. He would always just be standing there in blue jean overalls and a red button-down flannel shirt. When I would turn to look at him, he was always gone though. This happened off and on for about a year when I was told that I was moving back to the main office and that they were hiring someone else to run the warehouse. I worked at the main office for about one year after that and they decided that they wanted to expand the warehouse by getting the section next to ours that had just been vacated. So now we had two identical sections and the owners were going to cut and frame a hole in the wall by the dock area so that we could use our forklift on both sides. So come Monday morning I start working at the warehouse with Jonathan, the guy that was hired to take my place. As this was an on-demand shipping warehouse for manufacturing companies, we had a lot of downtime there. I had been there for about a month and we were sitting in the office goofing about, just talking about this and that, and I mentioned how the warehouse was kind of creepy. Jonathan replies with, yeah, especially that old guy who you'll see standing at the end of the aisles as you're working. Now, I had never met him before working together and never mentioned seeing the old man to anyone. I mean, I would sound crazy, right? We started trading stories though about seeing this old guy and 30 minutes later we went back to work. After we had discussed the old man is when things started heating up though. We'd be working in the warehouse and we would hear the bathroom doors on the opposite side of the office wall open and slam closed. You would hear footsteps and when you went to investigate them there would be nobody there. To try and stop the bathroom doors opening and closing I even put padlocks on them. And this stopped it for a while but one day as we were sitting in the office I heard the bathroom doors open and slam close so hard they shook the wall which was made of six layers of fireproof sheetrock. We ran to the other side of the warehouse and both doors were closed but the locks were laying on the floor still locked. I don't even know how that's possible to be honest. Fast forward six months and I get a call at midnight that one of our customers has an audit in the morning and needs to have a count of all their product in our warehouse by 8am. So I get dressed and drive to the warehouse. I get there at around 1 in the morning and have to walk 200 feet in the pitch black to the back of the warehouse to turn the lights on. I start doing the inventory when I hear three loud knocks on the back door. I just froze and listened. Then three more loud knocks on the door. I said to myself that 
There's just no way I'm answering that. Then the roll-up dock door, which is a good four or five feet off the ground, started shaking violently like someone was trying to rip it off. I threw my clipboard on the ground and I ran out the front door and jumped in my car. I was about three miles down the road when I pulled into a church parking lot and talked myself into going back to the locked doors. I drove around back to see if maybe it was a truck driver that had showed up early, but there was nobody around back in the dock area. I drove back around the front and I locked the door and went home. Now, the final experience was one night as I was going to bed. My wife always went to sleep before me as I'm a bit of a night owl. I had laid down in bed and just sort of started falling asleep when my wife goes, Why are you standing at the foot of the bed? When I say my heart stopped beating, I am not exaggerating. I sit up in bed and at the foot was a shadow figure just standing there and as I share this, I still get cold chills just remembering it. I jumped out of bed and as soon as I did that, it was just as if this thing just disappeared. Like, didn't fade out or anything, it just sort of vanished right before my eyes in like milliseconds. As this was during the age of the internet, I started looking up information and the main thing that I kept seeing was, if it isn't trying to cause you harm, then just try speaking to it. So the next day when I went to work, I stood in the middle of the warehouse and just said out loud, I'm not sure who you are or what you want, but I acknowledge that you're here. I mean you no harm, I just work here and am here to do a job. You're welcome to stay here if you're friendly and I'll leave you alone if you leave me alone. I did similar when I got home, except I stated that this was my home and that they were not welcome. I wanted them to leave, and since that day, I surprisingly have never experienced anything else at the warehouse or my home ever again. I no longer work for my family or at our warehouse, but I still drive by there sometimes, and I think about the old man in the overalls. Hopefully, whoever he is, he's doing alright. So I've had a stalker for about four years now. He was never aggressive or sent me proper threats, so stubborn as I am, I did my best to ignore him and not give him the satisfaction of showing him any fear. To be honest, after a while I also wasn't even scared anymore since he almost never came close to me. I know being stalked can affect people severely, even in a case like mine, and that's totally valid, but I guess I just got lucky and was never really psychologically affected by it. His stalking behavior mostly just consisted of sending me letters and gifts such as photos of my own apartment building from the outside, things that he dug out of my trash can and so on. I called the police many times but they weren't able to or really tried to be honest to catch or identify him. But about three weeks ago I discovered the German version of the subreddit RIMA and thought that people might want to know about what it's like to have a stalker. Since I barely use any social media, aside from Reddit, and have no personally identifying information here, I didn't think that he'd ever see it. One person even asked, does he know that you're putting him on blast on Reddit? And I answered, maybe. Maybe it would make him angry. Maybe he'd be turned on. I don't know, and I don't really care. Well, I know the real answer now. He did see it, and he did not like it. Like I said, he was never aggressive and never came close to me. The closest that I know of was when he sent me a picture of myself, unlocking my apartment door, taken from the corner of the steps above. Sorry if that doesn't make sense, I really don't know how else to explain it, but I consider myself a pretty vigilant person and I'm thinking that he might have hit a camera there instead of being there to take the photo himself. I think I would have noticed him if he did. Anyway... I don't know how he got wind of the AMA, but he did. The next week was quiet, no letters, and I didn't see him anywhere. Then he left me letters with printed out questions and my answers from the subreddit. He also left me a long, hateful letter towards my boyfriend about an issue that I had posted. His letters were never hateful like that before, though he never seemed happy with my boyfriend. He wrote about how I should share the spotlight with him since I got so much attention thanks to him. A few days later I got a gift but this time he didn't leave it in my mailbox or at my car like he usually did. No, 
This time, he left it inside the apartment building right in front of my door. I didn't take it inside my apartment, but opened it outside. It was a pretty big box, which was also unusual, and it was taped shut. As I'm sharing this, I realized that it wasn't a good idea at all, and could have ended very badly for me, but luckily he didn't send me something terrible or anything. He did, however, send me several zip ties, a roll of tape, a TV remote with most buttons picked off, a pack of band-aids with a few used ones, and a framed picture of me. I could tell the picture was taken a few days ago and my boyfriend was next to me but cut out of the photo. The frame was shattered and the package was full of glass shards, clearly more than just what could have fallen out of the frame too and they were also intentionally put inside the crumbled newspaper that was stuffed in there and to keep it all in place and stuff. Anyway, I called the cops right away and gave it to them. They were more concerned this time, finally, thankfully, and told me that they'd send patrol cars more frequently. He didn't show up or leave me any letters or gifts for about another week and a half after that. But eight days ago, it started again. I found letters in my mailbox where he wrote about how he wasted his time on me, how I haven't been appreciating his effort, how he was wrong about me being special. Five days ago, I left my apartment in the morning and heard a crunch sound as I stepped on my doormat. He had put broken glass under it in the night. I went off to work because I was in a hurry and was just going to make my boyfriend call the police, but then I found my car had also been vandalized. The sides were scratched, the lights were smashed, and the windshield had a phrase painted on it. It's time soon. Miss my last name. I went back inside and called the cops myself. They found the same phrase on a note under the doormat. This time, they really, really took me seriously, which might have been because I was just, I don't know, angry at this point, which I made very clear. If for some reason you're like me and just too stubborn to be afraid of a stalker like mine, then all of this, the letters, the gifts, the photos, even the glass under my doormat, are just really annoying and inconvenient. But my car was useless to me now, and the threat, it scared even me. I did, however, have a dash cam in my car, and it caught everything. The police said that they would take the footage as evidence, even though the dash cam footage wasn't of high quality, and I had given them photos of him that were just as good before, but they said that it wasn't enough. And they told me that they'll look into it further and promise to send more patrol cars again. Then, it was quiet for two more days. Until two days ago. Someone rang the doorbell at just after 4am, my boyfriend and I got up, but we were both hesitant, but I saw blue lights outside, and just as I got up, I heard them shouting, this is the police, please open the door. They told us that they were called by one of the downstairs neighbors, who came home from his night shift about an hour earlier, and heard someone else enter the building after them before the door fell shut. My neighbors actually know of my situation, and I've asked them to make sure that they don't let strangers into the building this neighbor then went into his own apartment and looked through the peephole we have motion activated lights in the stairway so he waited to see if they turned back on and they did then he saw a middle-aged man walk upstairs above this neighbor there are only me and my boyfriend and a single mum with three kids who probably won't be getting any visitors at 3 a.m so naturally he called the police they came and they found my stalker, one half floor above me on the stairs. He should have been able to see the cop car since there's a little window up there and they had their lights on, but he either missed them or wanted to get caught. They found a pocket knife on him and he confessed to being my stalker right away. He was finally caught. They got him. It took four years, a provocative Reddit post and one very vigilant and caring neighbor, but he's finally done. For now, at least, he's facing several charges, and I've collected every single piece of evidence over the past four years. I don't know what kind of outcome I can expect, but for now, at least, I finally have some peace. Admittedly, I was a foolish and immature teenage girl when I graduated high school 23 years ago while others were focused on securing military futures and or furthering their education, 
I was really only looking forward to moving out of my parents' home and moving in with my high school sweetheart. It would end up being a, a huge mistake that I regret to this day, but I digress. For the sake of anonymity, we'll call him Jack. Though we lived in different towns and attended different schools, Jack and I had been dating a few years prior to graduation. When we weren't in school, we were pretty much inseparable, so it was no surprise to anyone when we started looking for a place to rent and move in together. But what did come as a surprise, however, was Jack's suggestion to share a place with two of his friends so that we could all split the bills. It wasn't uh, quite what I had in mind, but I was familiar with both of them and eventually, against my better judgment, agreed to having roommates. The four of us soon moved into the upstairs apartment of an old two-story house in a seedy neighborhood. Of course, it wasn't long before everything hit the fan as neither of the roommates consistently paid their share of the rent and the place was overrun by people who didn't even live there. The constant drug use, fighting, property damage, kicking out random people sleeping on the couch, etc. It was pure chaos and I was just a, an outcast living somewhere I clearly didn't belong but the worst part of it all for me was that Jack and I had grown apart. It was honestly as if I never even really knew Jack at all. Living in a house full of potheads and drug addicts for several months made me hate drugs too, and even weed to be honest. Yet I continued to smoke it myself in an attempt to find semblance of peace and happiness. My own friends would visit often, which also helped me to cope with all the stuff that I was living through to some extent. But still... Any time that I had a reason to get out of that house, I did, and so was the case on Halloween night of that year. But my friend, Steph, had stopped by to hang out and we both smoked for a bit before getting the munchies and realizing that it was Halloween. Being that there was never any food in the house, because someone would always steal it, we quickly recognized the solution to our problem and set out on foot to relive our youth and score some free chocolate bars. Now, I know what you might be thinking. Yes, we were too old for trick-or-treating. Yes, we should have been ashamed of ourselves for taking candy that was meant for little kids. Yes, we were selfish and immature. And no, we didn't care. We were just hungry. The timing was perfect, though, as people had just started filing down the streets with kids in goofy costumes, racing from door to door. Steph and I weren't wearing costumes because, well, we were bums. And that's the answer that we gave every time that we knocked on a door and they asked. I'm sure that the ones who didn't question us had already figured that out when they saw these two wrinkled Walmart bags that we held open for candy. But having satisfied our munchies while eating candy along our little adventure, we decided to keep walking and knocking as long as we could to increase our future candy stash. It wasn't until streets were silent and empty, with nearly every porch light turned off, before we finally called it quits and began our long trek back to the apartment in the dark the mood though it soon changed on the walk back you see up to that point it had been a fun and memorable night but for some reason neither of us could shake this awful feeling of impending doom as if we were about to star in our own real life horror movie from a rational perspective this fear was simply due to walking in the dark on halloween and smoking a bit but the fact that we never told anyone where we were going or what we were doing stuck in our minds we weren't even sure if anyone knew that we left the apartments, to be honest. Not that any of them would have really cared, but the mere thought of nobody having a shred of information to share if we went missing somehow was suddenly quite unsettling. Anyway, the night air grew colder by the time that we finally found ourselves speeding down the hilly block of houses that led to my apartment, and we were both glad to see that the porch light in front of my door was still on. We slowed our pace toward the bottom of the hill and as we crossed the street toward the sidewalk, our fears soon became a reality. From behind a vehicle parked in our neighbor's driveway, a very tall man quietly stepped out of the darkness. As silly as it sounds, he was wearing what appeared to be a, a large hairy werewolf mask draped over his entire head, paired with Freddy Krueger gloves on his hands. He stared intently, gently tapping the long, spiky claws of one glove against his chest as he rounded the bumper of the vehicle before slowly moving toward us with each step. It was actually quite terrifying at first, but I quickly assumed that it must have been someone that we knew from the apartment trying to scare us. 
So brave little me started laughing and mocking this stupid outfit. But what the man did next sent chills to my core. Still silent, he stopped moving, sort of cocked his head to one side and lowered his hand from his chest. Then he suddenly started speed walking right toward us. A second wave of fear coursed through my veins as Steph and I instantly bolted across the sidewalk toward the front door. Steph made it through the threshold first and I leapt inside soon after, quickly turning to slam the door and lock it. I saw the wolf mask facing me immediately behind the door as I did so too, and just as I locked the deadbolt, he tried turning the handle from the other side of the door to get in. We were merely a split second away from, well, whatever that was. Steph and I collapsed on the floor trying to catch our breath as we heard him scratching at the door with his claws. Someone eventually looked down the stairwell to see what the commotion was about, but by that time, the scratching had ceased. As we made our way upstairs to see who was and who wasn't in the apartment, I was shocked to see a room full of people that included both of the guys that I suspected of pulling the prank, as they were a similar height and build to the man outside. One of the guys did go outside to see who might be trying to get in, but the man was long gone. Everyone in the apartment denied having anything to do with it, and to be honest, everyone was accounted for there, so it really didn't seem like it was them. The only other possibility that crossed my mind was the guy who lived below us with his wife and baby on the first floor, but when I later asked his wife about it, she told me that it couldn't have been him because they were all inside that night, and they didn't have any company either. Steph and I... We never did learn the true identity of the Wolfman, and I guess we'll never know what his true intentions were that night, but I mean, perhaps it was all just a well-orchestrated prank by someone that we knew, right? Or maybe it was simply a prank by a random stranger. I prefer to think of it as a prank either way, because regardless of who was behind the mask, the thought of this being anything other than a prank is, quite honestly, very disturbing. As for Jack, our relationship finally ended when I left him. After I moved out, he kicked his friends out of the apartment for not paying rent and he was stuck cleaning up the mess that they left behind too. It was a great time to man up for Jack, I suppose, but anyway, to anyone who made it this far, I guess the lesson here is trust your instincts. Stay smart, stay safe, and stay sane out there, especially this Halloween. So this happened years ago in the 80s when I was 19. I live in a small town in the south and it was common to have bonfires in the woods on the weekends in the fall. But my friend and I, both female, went to a spot where a few others were hanging out in an open area in the woods. There was a fire and we were all standing around drinking wine coolers and beer, just talking and hanging out. The main subject being a friend of ours who went missing a few days earlier. He was the kind of guy everyone knew, but I wasn't close friends with him or anything. My friend is talking to someone though, and a guy comes over to me and starts making small talk. He seemed a, a little bit weird, and I only knew him as the guy who dated a girl that I went to grade school with. I couldn't quite understand why, but I felt a chill and an eerie feeling while he was talking with me. So much so, in fact, that I walked away in the middle of his conversation and grabbed my friend and told her that we needed to leave now. She seemed a bit confused, but could tell by my tone that something was wrong. When we got to the car, I told her that I couldn't explain it, but I just felt really uneasy. So we left, and we didn't think much else about it. Well, a couple of days later, the guy's body was found, the guy that was missing, in a shallow grave in the woods, and it was soon discovered that he was murdered over a dispute about a girl by none other than the weird guy making small talk with me at the fire. I still get creeped out thinking about just how casually he was just out in the woods, hanging out, knowing that he murdered a guy and that everyone was discussing the missing friend in front of him. A twist to the story too is that a few years later, he escaped prison and was on the run for about a week. I worked at a movie store at the time and one day a woman came in to rent a VCR and movies. She was on some kind of drugs and very obviously high. She was all over the place and her eyes were wide and she was talking non-stop. And then she proceeded to tell me that she was staying at a cabin at the lake with the escaped murderer that I just told you about. 
I acted normal and began filing out the info for her to rent and told her that I had to get something from the back. I called the law and I told them what she said and they ended up following her and catching the guy again. There were lots of creepy encounters growing up in the 80s. I loved growing up then but definitely had a lot of close calls and weird encounters when I was younger. And this one is one that I'll never forget. So I work in a retirement home and my job often requires me to go into the basement with a cart full of dirty laundry. That means that I have to use the elevator a lot. I've done this a thousand times already and never ever did I hear or see anything unusual. Now, since I work in a retirement home, amongst a lot of other rooms in the basement, there is also a temporary morgue which is located opposite of the elevator entrance. This morgue was probably used at some point in time, but as long as I've ever been working there, it has never been unlocked. Nobody used that room for anything. Today, I was working as normal, going about my day, not feeling creeped out at all since it was the middle of the day, and I've been to this basement too many times already and never had the reason to be scared of it. I went down to the basement, emptied the dirty laundry in the laundry room, and called the elevator down again since somebody had to use it. I pressed the button, but the elevator wasn't coming down. Above me, through the closed elevator doors, I could hear two of my co-workers speaking and holding the elevator from closing. The space in the elevator is very acoustic, and you can easily hear people on it from the basement all the way up to the third floor. At this point, I was getting a little bit annoyed, because it was a particularly busy day, and I didn't have any time to spare, so I started knocking on the elevator doors to let them know that I was waiting for it. After a few knocks, it didn't seem to me that they didn't register it as someone knocking for them to get off the elevator, so I decided to knock in a little sort of melody or rhythm to get their attention. And this is where something very weird happened. Maybe five seconds after that knock, I started hearing knocking back. It didn't have any particular pattern, and it didn't have any particular pattern, and it sounded like literal knocking on a door. I first thought that it was coming from my co-workers above, but quickly realized that it was coming from behind me. I turned around to find the basement completely empty, and I couldn't quite figure out at first where it was coming from. That is, until I came a few feet closer to the sound. It was coming from the morgue. I froze. A thousand thoughts came rushing through my mind as I tried to somehow rationalize what I was hearing. I wanted to leave the cart behind and just sprint up the stairs to get out of there when I heard the elevator finally coming down. It was the longest wait ever, but I finally got on and pressed the button to the third floor. I must have pressed it 20 times before the door closed too and got me out of there. Now, maybe all of this can be very easily explained away with it being an older building, sounds from the pipes or animals or something like that, and being a pure coincidence with my knocking, but... I never heard the building ever make a knocking sound on the door like that before, and it definitely sounded more than just an animal. Needless to say, though, whatever it was, it really creeped me out. This was uh, right around when I was entering 8th grade. I remember all of the events vividly, like it happened yesterday, too. At this house that we had, it was amazing. It was a huge one-story house. The backyard was massive, boarding a, a riverbed too. There was a huge metal shed in the back that looked like it was used to work on semi-trucks. It was a four-bedroom house. And my brother's room, which was technically a den, was converted into a room as well. It had long corridors to get to all other parts of the house. The kitchen was long like a hall lined with counters. To get to the three bedrooms on the other side of the house, we had to pass the living room and then walk down the long hallway that was L-shaped. My mother's room was at the end of this long hallway, which is where most of the worst events happened. I only know my other siblings and parents' encounters because they told me as an adult, where before they didn't want to scare me, I guess, because I also had my own experiences that they knew about. So... It started with small things, like just uneasy feelings. 
Weird smells like baby powder, misplaced objects, knocking on doors early in the mornings, but the first major incident was when my uncle lived with us. We were sitting in the living room and we had one of those old school big screen TVs. You know the ones that basically took up the whole corner of the room? There was my uncle's phone on top charging. Keep in mind this is a flat surface as my mum had decorations on top of this TV. But we were watching TV when suddenly we all watched the phone light up the corner of the room super bright with just the screen and before my uncle could move to check it, it flew off the TV. I don't mean like it slid, like it legit flew, as if someone had struck it and it just went flying across the room. But we all got startled by that. My mum came running from the kitchen, and my uncle, which is about in his 30s at the time, explains exactly what happened. In shock, he said, no one touched it. It lit up bright and then just freaking flew off the TV. We all kind of brushed it off, but it was nevertheless the first event of many. The next event kind of jumps from harmless to major, I think, but my brother was in the kitchen washing his plate for breakfast, when suddenly he explains feeling a, a real dreadful feeling, but he said that he ignored it, and as he was standing there, he said it felt like a gush of wind passed by him. He even said that he felt a tug on his shirt. Thinking that it was one of our many siblings, he spun around to see who was there, but there was no one. He was alone. Kind of freaked out, he told my mum what happened since she's the most spiritual out of all of us. She's a big time Christian. And stay with me here because we're kind of going to jump around in timeliness based on harmless encounters to the worst ones. So, I remember getting ready for school one morning too and I began to feel the anxiety and dreadful feeling again. I began to scan my room as I tied my shoes on the chair facing the doorway. And it was at this point that... I caught a glimpse of an all-black hand wrap around the doorframe of my room. I jumped back, startled, and I saw a full black face peer from the corner of my doorframe. Its face was pasty black, its eyes were all black, and it was wearing a, an old feather hat sort of thing. I jumped up and screamed, and it quickly disappeared from the doorway. My mum came running in, and I explained with tears in my eyes about what I had just seen. She didn't play it off either, and... She started to pray with me, and then finally, this is my last experience in this house, although my other siblings continued to have things happen to them. It was my bedtime, and I shared a room with my older brother. I didn't like sleeping alone after seeing whatever that thing was that was watching me tie my shoes that day. But my brother had a late bedtime because he was in high school. I would go to bed first alone, and I remember being scared but falling asleep that night. I awoke to a silent dark room at some stage, and for some reason, I couldn't move. I looked around the room from my top bunk bed, and we had these huge glass mirrors for closet doors, and in the reflection, I watched a creature crawl out from under the bed and hop onto the bottom bunk where my brother was sleeping. It was staring at me, and it had piercing red eyes. The only way that I can explain it too is that it looked like an evil monkey. I began to scream and cry because I couldn't move. My brother began to wake up. This thing hops off my brother's bed and quickly goes back under the bed. My brother jumps up and turns on the light. I explain what happened as I could move and talk now. He went to get my mum and I remember being terrified, being left there alone in that room. Well, while he went to get my mum. But she came in and we prayed and after that, I think I went to bed and eventually I fell asleep. So, like I said, those are my experiences, but these next events are all from my siblings. So my sister often had vivid dreams of a body hanging from the window in the restroom, even to the point that she had a dream of my oldest brother hanging there. There was just something about that wall in the restroom and the window. Everyone felt uneasy about it, even before my sister ever mentioned the dreams about it. I remember being woken up by my brother at one point, he explained that he was in the restroom, and as he sat there, he said that he became fixated on the wall and the window. He began to feel panic and fear. He said the lights flickered, and he caught a glimpse of a noose hanging from the window frame, and he freaked out and quickly finished and ran out of the restroom. Now, I've never seen fear in any of my brother's eyes, but that night, that night was different. He asked me to stay awake with him that night. I agreed, and... 
We talked all night till the sun came up and there was light in the room. And we both fell asleep once enough light was in the room from outside that we felt safe. This next one is from the perspective of my older sister. My sister would often hear children playing in the hallway from her room or inside of her room even. The sounds changed from just laughing and small voices to children eventually calling her name. She would explain when she took a shower that she would hear them outside of the door calling her. When she would be in her room, she would hear them calling from down the hallway. She was always freaked out and still to this day says that she hated that house. This next one is from the perspective of my older brother. He was asleep when suddenly he was awoken by a loud noise. He explained that he tried to move but couldn't. The bed began to shake violently and the walls were cracking and shaking. He honestly thought that there was an earthquake for a moment, but he couldn't move. As he lay there helpless, he said that it was almost like a train was running through the room. Everything was shaking and there were sounds of a, a train running over tracks. He said that he closed his eyes and started to pray, and when he opened them, the room was back to normal. No cracks, no shaking, no noise. This same brother would have this same experience multiple times too, except every time was different. Sometimes he would hear trains, people talking like a busy train station, and other times he would hear children screaming and crying. To this day, he still has no explanation for what he heard or anything that he saw. The next one is half my perspective and half my sister-in-law's. For perspective too, we had a dining room which had a door to the front of the house. It was connected to the long kitchen and the doorway to my brother's room was on the right. We also had a computer in the corner and I remember watching a movie in my brother's room which was the den converted into a room that I spoke about earlier. We all fell asleep on the floor and I remember being woken up by some sort of a loud sound. I hear my sister-in-law saying, what the heck is that? I rolled over and I hear that too. Everyone around us was asleep, but it sounded like somebody was on the computer typing on the keyboard, with the occasional clicking of the mouse even. She said go and check and I was too afraid due to the past events, but I reluctantly checked to see nothing. The computer was off and we both were freaked out, but after a while... We must have fallen back to sleep. This was the beginning of my siblings and parents seeing things too. One of my brothers were walking through the hallway and explained seeing a figure of a man standing in the doorway of my mum's room at the end of the hall. He said that it looked at him and reached for the doorknob and walked outside to the patio. This next one too was one of the scariest things to happen. My uncle was living with us still at the time and I remember walking in the door with my parents he immediately stops us and says, you guys have demons in this house. There's something seriously wrong with this place. I remember the despair on my parents' face knowing exactly what he meant too. He explains to us that coming home to an empty house, nobody was home. He walked in the doorway and looked down the hall. And he explains seeing two small children run from the corner of the L-shaped hall and into my sister's room. The one that always heard the children calling her and playing in the hallway. He was surprised because his logical explanation was that my mum left some of us to do something. He walked into my sister's room to ask what we were doing home alone, but he didn't find anyone in the room. He said that he checked everywhere too, convinced that there were children still at home. But just when he was about to give up, he suddenly heard laughing in the hallway. When he looked down to the hallway... He saw the same small children run from the bathroom into my room, only just catching a glimpse. He was now confused because he said that no one passed him to go back out of my sister's room. He said that he was upset and called our names to come out from hiding and stop playing with him. He searched the whole house but found no one. He was home alone. I remember sitting there too, scared listening to this because the last room that they entered was mine. The next story is my mother's story. She explained that my oldest brother who works nights would sneak into her room in the early morning and sit on her bed to let them know that he was home and they would get up and drink a coffee and just talk sometimes. She explained being awoken up by the sound of her door opening and she said that she had a feeling that it was not my brother though. And instead of my brother coming straight to the bed, she heard her cupboards open and someone sort of rummaging through them. Then they closed and... 
she heard footsteps heading toward her bed. Then she felt someone sit on the bed. She turned around to say hi to my brother, but when she did, nobody was there. She explained that there was an impression on the bed, though, as if someone was actually sitting there. My mother, being the God-fearing woman that she was, laughed and began to pray. That's when she said the impression disappeared and she heard footsteps leaving her room. The next story is the same brother who had something pull on his shirt in the kitchen that night. It's the same thing. He was washing his dish, except we were all in the kitchen cleaning up from breakfast, when suddenly... He said that he felt the gush of wind again and something pulled him harder this time. He turned around to see and remembers getting up off the floor with everyone around him. But from my perspective, he just blacked out. He collapsed onto the floor with no warning. We even had the paramedics come that night, but in the end he was fine. No one could explain what happened either. And it was weird. But this house, this house was something evil. We always knew that something was wrong with it, but we finally had the answers. We were all in the living room watching TV one morning when I remember my mum opening the front door. She moved her attention to some random guy standing in the front yard. He said, oh, I'm sorry, I don't mean to scare you. I used to live here when I was a kid. My mum said, oh, you did? He said, yeah, like 20 years ago. My mum said, can I ask you some questions? And he said, what do you want to know? But... Before you ask, yes, the house is haunted or cursed, he said with a scared look. My mum, shocked, asked him to explain, and he began to explain all the experiences that we've been having. My mum was pretty shocked by this and says, well, what about the knocking or the baby powder? He says, oh, that was my mum. She had a heart attack in the back restroom. Don't worry, she would knock on our doors in the morning to let us know that she was still around, since apparently she did that when she was alive. She would wear a lot of baby powder for some reason too, like it would fluff off her when she sat down, and which explains the knocking earlier in the mornings and the powder smell throughout the house, I guess. But he said you would have to be careful because there's an American native chief here as well. well we all said, what? He pulled out his phone and pulls up a picture. It's a picture of a developed photo and it shows some people on the patio at a party. They're standing in the front of the bar that we have in the backyard and... Behind them is a huge figure with a chief hat on his head, feathers and all, except his face is completely black and so are his eyes. The man explained that there are several ghosts and demons in this house apparently. He even explained that they had a theory that someone hung themselves in the restroom, which also explains the dreams that my sister would have and my brother seeing the rope that day. In the end we thanked him and he rode his bike away. We never did see that guy again or figure out where he was from or anything. And he was riding a bike, which was weird, but he couldn't have lived too far, I guess. But we never did see him again. After a few years, we moved out of that house. I was really happy too because all the experiences ended once we moved. But I remember being in high school and my friend was talking about how he just moved across the street. He explained the house and it was the same one. I warned him and he laughed at me and said nothing has happened yet. But a few weeks later, he came up to me and said he believed me. He said that he was in the fridge getting milk this morning and no one was home, just him. And someone came super close to his ear and he could feel their breath on his neck and they said in a low, deep voice, what are you doing here? Throughout the school year, he would tell me all the things that would happen there which actually in turn were way worse than what we ever experienced. I believe that whatever my mum was doing was protecting us there, which I'm thankful for. Obviously, there's a lot more to this and many more experiences, but these, these were by far the, the most standout-ish, I guess you could say. In the end, I know it sounds a bit weird, but I guess I'm grateful for the experiences. It's definitely shaped my perspective on life and things in life, but I'm also very grateful that I no longer live there. Last week, I uh, matched with a girl on Tinder. She was cute and we got along fairly well, so I decided to just go for it and I asked her to meet up on Saturday. And to my surprise, she said yes. 
I suggested to just drive around town, but she insisted that I go over to her place instead. And without much thought, I agreed. I arrived around 9pm, this was about 20 minutes from my town. The house seemed very uh, unkept at first, but I didn't think anything of it since there were many old houses in this area. But there was only one streetlight near her house and I parked near it. I texted her, letting her know that I was there and she hearted the message. I knocked a few times, but there was no answer. I tried calling again, but again there was no answer. Then I texted her that I was leaving and I walked back to my car. Once inside, I saw messages asking where I was going and to come back and I saw someone standing on the porch, but not from her house. It was from the house next door. They were not there before when I arrived and the shadowy figure was not from a petite young girl. It seemed bulkier, like a man. I was freaked out by that and so I left, but when I got back home, I saw that the profile had been completely deleted. To this day, I, I don't really know what to think of it. Was it just some sort of innocent prank or was there more to it? It still gives me the creeps when I think about it. So this actually happened to my husband and I was just a witness to it so I'm going to do my best to convey his part of the story from his perspective the way that he told me. But first, I'll start with mine. So we were living in a small one bedroom apartment in Tucson, Arizona with my 12 year old Pitbull and our Siamese kitten Simon. Our bedroom door was directly across the hallway from our bathroom door. And when I was laying in bed watching TV, if the bedroom door was open, I could see the bathroom door. So, while I was laying in bed watching TV, my husband was in the bathroom taking a shower. The only thing that I heard from my bed was Simon meowing and yowling like crazy outside the bathroom door while he desperately clawed at the door. Irritated, I yelled at him until my husband came out of the bathroom white as a sheet holding a, a burnt bath towel in his hand. But even though our walls are so thin, I can usually hear the water running in the bathroom, I realized that it was weirdly quiet in the bathroom from where I was sitting, which was very to the contrary of what he told me was going on in the bathroom. And not to mention that he couldn't even hear our kitty Simon losing his mind just on the other side of the door trying to get in or me yelling at him. All my husband could hear was what he described to me as the sound of a coming train coupled with the sound of an old lady moaning. When he pulled open the shower curtain to see what was making the strange sound, to his horror, his bath towel hanging from the towel rack on the wall was suddenly on fire. He said in the moment he was panicking about the fire and didn't consider it spontaneously ignited on its own in a steam-filled bathroom on a damp towel. He just saw it burning and jumped out of the shower and started smacking the towel to try and extinguish the flames. But as he did this, from the top down, he said the flames just sort of seemed to move down the towel and... As he put it out on the bottom, it reignited on the top and vice versa. Even stranger, the flames were mostly blue and he said that they didn't feel hot. As soon as he finally got the fire to completely extinguish, he quickly grabbed the towel and brought it out to show me. And if I hadn't have seen it for myself, I, I don't know if I would have believed him. I know that he wouldn't lie to me about something like that too, but I'd be concerned about his mental health, I guess. But I did see the towel, I saw it, I touched it, and I even smelt it. It was a thick, oversized, dark grey towel, and down the centre, there were two burn marks in the shape of a hockey sticks, for lack of a better descriptive word. But even though I could clearly see it had been burned, the area that it was burnt didn't feel burnt, if that makes sense, and even stranger, it didn't even smell burnt. I took a picture of the towel and then we quickly disposed of it. I don't have any idea what happened or how it happened, but I just didn't want to stay in the home that day. The picture sat on my iPhone until last year when I lost it forever when my phone went missing, but I'm still trying to find a copy of it somewhere and if I do, I'll, I'll add it to this story. This happened in 2018 and we've had several paranormal encounters since then, but nothing compares to the self-burning towel and it still freaks us out to this day. I mean, what the heck happened that day? It 
This happened several months ago, and at the time, I had recently lost my car due to a motor vehicle accident. So I walked for 30 minutes to the store, thinking that I'd be able to beat the sunset back. But I was wrong. By the time that I was done picking up my grocery, it was pitch black outside. The thing is, is that I live in a pretty woodsy area where there are not even many sidewalks, so I really didn't think that it was safe to walk back. I tried getting my brother and cousin to pick me up and drop me off, but they wouldn't have been able to make it for a while, so instead I decided to get a lift. There was a photo of a suspicious looking creepy old man popped up as my driver, and I waited at the sidewalk for my ride. And maybe like 10 minutes later, the driver arrived. It was a silver Toyota sedan, and the driver was an old man wearing a cap and large framed rectangular glasses. Instantly, something just felt off about this guy too. His aura was just wrong. But I tried not to let it bother me too much. After all, my home is literally down the street, I reminded myself. I asked him if I could set my groceries in the trunk of his car, and he nodded. I dropped it in without noticing what was in his trunk of his vehicle because where we were stopped, it was pretty dark with no street lamps. I helped myself into the car and told him that I lived back there, pointing in the direction from which the vehicle had arrived, and let him know that he was only a three minute drive away from my home. I saw him nod, or so I thought anyway, and as soon as the light switched to green, he made a right. I thought that he was making the right turn to turn the vehicle around, but instead he sort of passed the main road that he was supposed to take to get to my home. I let him know immediately that my home was that way while pointing in the direction, and he acknowledged it but still kept going straight, claiming that there was an issue with his GPS, and he started driving us in the complete opposite direction of my home where the roads were completely empty. I uh, suddenly didn't feel safe. I had a terrible feeling in the pit of my stomach, in fact. In that moment of panic, I immediately reached for my phone to SOS, assuming the worst, but then I stopped myself and told myself to just calm down. Make a U-turn, I tried to tell the driver as calmly as possible. I didn't want him to hear the panic in my voice, but he didn't respond. My request to turn around was just completely ignored, and... I just couldn't keep calm any longer, so I finally yelled for him to make a right and turn around, and he reluctantly complied. Along the way back to the road that took me to my home, it felt like the longest three minutes of my life, but just when I thought that I would finally be home safe, the driver then suggested an alternate route, even though my home was simply right and then right, via the main road and very, very close by. I immediately felt that something was really, really wrong. He slowed down next to a sort of woodsy area, an isolated path along the way, asked if I'd ever been there before and that we could take this route instead. I froze. Again, I went into panic mode, but I forced myself to calm down as not to let him know that I was suspicious of him. I raised my voice once more, telling him that my home was that way, while pointing toward the main road, which wasn't very far. He finally obliged after some reluctancy, and started driving back toward the main road again. The entire time on the way to my home, my heart was racing and my palms were sweating. We arrived at my complex maybe five minutes later, and I spoke to him very nicely so that he doesn't try something funny that would force him to react in such a manner that would put my life in further danger. I told him that I'd be tipping him well for such a short drive, which would be $10. I quickly hopped out of the car and jolted to the trunk to retrieve my groceries, and as I grabbed my bags, I saw something that I hadn't noticed before because this time, the street lamps surrounding my complex illuminated the trunk of his car. And I froze as I grabbed my groceries, because in the trunk of his vehicle was a rope, a mallet, and a bag filled with something. I was immediately trembling from fear. I ran up to my building so quickly and checked outside my window as soon as I got up to my apartment to make sure that he wasn't still lurking and watching and thankfully, I never had to hear or see from that old man ever again. If I had to guess, 
I would say that he was up to something evil and twisted, from which I miraculously escaped because, for whatever reason, he decided to change his mind about the intentions that he had for me that night. To this day, I can only guess as to what his intentions were, but judging by the items that I found in the trunk of his vehicle, it's not something that I would have ever had wished to find out. I live alone in an apartment in Utah. My area is fairly metropolitan, and it's not uncommon to see unhoused people near my building. Since I'm a single woman, 20, I'm usually more cautious about locking doors and setting alarms than my friends with roommates. I have an alarm system and also two deadbolt locks on my door. Because my area has lots of break-ins, I'm also sure to always lock everything no matter what. Now, two nights ago, I came home late from a night out with friends, but I was sober. I made sure to lock everything and set the alarms like usual. But when I woke up the next morning, I heard somebody in the house. They were wearing shoes and just sort of walking around. One of my friends has the code to my alarm, but none of my friends have a key. I'm the only person that I know with the key to the second deadbolt on my door. Not even my landlord has that. I leaned my head out the door of my bedroom, which is just a few feet from the more open living room or kitchen area where the sound was coming from. And there, standing there, was a, a man in my kitchen. He was about six feet tall and maybe 40 years old. He was wearing a full suit and tie but seemed really tired or drunk maybe. He was standing by the fridge and eating leftovers out of the Tupperware and just kind of staring. I ducked back into my room and called 911. And for the next 10 minutes, I stood by my bedroom door and listened to this man eat a bunch of food from my fridge. When he was done with something, he would just drop the container to the floor. When the police showed up, both deadbolts were still locked. They knocked on the door and the man in my apartment answered. The police rushed him and yelled that it was okay now. When I came out of the bedroom, they had the man pinned to the floor and I saw that he had rearranged the furniture in my living room. But there were containers all over my floor as well. The man wasn't saying anything and he never said anything even when the police were asking him questions. After they took him away, the officer told me that the man had business cards in his wallet and apparently he works at a bank downtown. But the weirdest thing is that my alarm was set and my deadbolts were locked from the inside, even when he was in my apartment. None of the windows were unlocked and I'm on the fourth floor or open either. To this day, I still have no idea how he got into my house. It makes me wonder, how long had this guy actually been in my house for? So, the village that I lived in was only about maybe 40 to 50 people at most living there. Everyone knew everyone, all 12 of us kids knew each other too and played with each other. And naturally, some of us grouped together and explored the surrounding area since there wasn't much in the way of entertainment back then, mid to late 90s, in rural Ohio that is. The village was old. The furthest back that I could find about the village documentation wise was that it was established back in late 1790s or something as a small trading hub for the local area. Ohio didn't actually become a state until 1803. My village had a single church in the center of it, an old schoolhouse converted into an actual house just next to it, and pasture behind it with thick woods surrounding like three of the four sides of the small town. My dad grew up around the area, so he was full of legends and stories about the area. But one of those stories was about a small fort that was originally French, turned British, and finally colonial American in the area. Nobody really knew exactly where it was located, but there was a few mentions of a small fort in the area from the research that I'd done. Now, one of the stories about this fort was that it was a primary trade route for the local native tribes and the influx of settlers that were arriving in the area. Naturally, conflicts arose as more and more people settled the surrounding area, and eventually, all that conflict ensued between the settlers and the native tribes. The fort was said to be destroyed by fire, people on both sides slaughtered each other, 
and eventually the natives were driven from the area with the help of a local militia. But my dad always told me the land wasn't good, tainted in ways with bad energy, and I guess when entire families are slaughtered and people being driven away from their homeland, it can cause some long-term ill effects. Anyway, when all of us kids were playing, we were always told two things. One, if the woods get quiet, you get quiet and leave immediately. And two, if your name is being called out and you're way out in the woods, do not respond. Go home immediately and never look back. Pretend that you never even heard it to begin with. Everyone in the village knew how quirky the area was. Most days were the usual bland days. Well, some days it was like a, a fairy tale, I guess. Periodically other days it could be a nightmare. The people of the woods were probably the most common entity everyone in the village knew of and were generally treated with respect and a wide berth. But some of the other things were, well, generally best left well alone entirely. So, now, on to my experience. In the late 90s, I was around 10 years old when I was overcome with an insatiable desire to go camping. It was mid-August, so hot and muggy during the day, but pretty cool and mild at night. I gathered two of my friends and told them about it, and they both liked the idea. Now, generally, nobody really camped in our woods. My parents, along with many others, really didn't like the idea of a group of 10 or 11-year-olds going camping alone. My dad said that we could as long as he came with us just to ensure that we were safe, and I reluctantly agreed. Prior to that night, I went out to scout out a good area to make camp at, and I knew of a fairly decent place that was close to the creek, relatively flat and not difficult to get to. I wanted to scout the area just to ensure that it was cleared of debris and ready for tents. By this time, I was well acquainted with the people of the woods, and I made my offering before entering the woods. I didn't see them while on my journey or anything, so I felt pretty good about that. But once I arrived at the location, I began moving things around, clearing out the sticks, large stones, and making a fire pit. Even going as far as stocking it with wood and throwing some larger sticks nearby for fuel for later. I was so enthralled in what I was doing and so focused on getting the area cleared that by the time that I was satisfied with what I had done... I just noticed just how quiet everything around me became. When I say quiet too, I mean like completely dead silent. No birds, bugs, not even the wind made a noise amongst the leaf litter. I immediately shut down everything that I was doing. I stood there looking around slowing my breathing and just trying to listen for the faintest sound that I could. I don't know how long I stood there motionless. Maybe a few minutes. Maybe... But then, in the far distance, I could hear a crow call, and almost immediately I began hearing the chirping of robins, and even a faint whistling from the wind in the trees. I really don't know why, but the hair on my arms and neck were on end, and I figured, well, maybe it was just me making a ruckus that everything nearby quieted down because of that? Content with that logical reasoning, I began making my way back home up for the night. And around 6pm that night, my two friends made their way over with their backpacks, tents, and both me and my dad were finishing up dinner. All four of us made ready with everything that we needed and began trekking out to the site that I'd prepared. Nothing all that noteworthy happened going to the site, even after setting up our tents, lighting the fire and making s'mores. It was shaping up to be a pretty fun night really and rather enjoyable. Once we started to get ready to crawl into our tents for the night, around 10 or 11 p.m., the wind started to pick up and my dad said that we might be in for some rain, but he didn't seem to have a look of contentment. My dad loved the rain on his face when he said it. It was like, I don't know, he felt something was off or something. And it wasn't long that all of us started to feel that way too, we all sort of ended up crawling into our tents anyway, since it was night time, and with possible rain incoming, trekking back home would have really sucked. But honestly, we should have walked back. 
We situated our tents in a, a sort of half circle around the fire pit, which all were facing the creek and the back of the tents facing the wood line. My dad was to the left of me in his military surplus tent, and me in my cheapo Walmart single person tent, just barely large enough for me, and my two friends to my right in their own tents. The wind was howling for some time, half an hour to an hour before it calmed down, and then it got quiet. No crickets, no wind, no wildlife at all. The creek itself, which usually bubbles happily along, sounded muted all of a sudden. All we had at that time was the faint glow of embers from the fire pit in front of our tents casting a warm glow. I began to hear my heart throbbing in my ears and I knew that my dad and my two friends were just as anxious as I was as I could hear them sort of shifting uncomfortably. I heard one of my friends tent zipper and naturally I undid my zipper too to see what was going on. And as soon as I popped my head out to look... I saw my dad come out of his tent with a machete that he had and he faced the wood line. My friend had his head poking out too and asked if I heard what that noise was. I didn't hear anything, but my heart was pounding so hard that it was hard hearing him even whisper. We both partially got out of the tent to see what my dad was looking at, but all we could see was like inky darkness and it was then that I heard it. A distant and faint hello. It was coming from some ways away in the darkness of the woods. I could see my dad shift uncomfortably on his feet, white knuckling his machete, looking into the wood line. Then again, a voice called out, hello. But it just didn't seem right. It was off-putting, almost as if whoever was speaking was trying to speak in a, a very feminine voice, faint and fragile. My dad motioned me to grab some of the extra wood next to his tent and throw it on the fire, which I reluctantly did. Leaving the perceived safety of my tent didn't sit well with me. As the fire began to slowly grow in brightness, my dad stepped backwards near the fire and stood there facing the wood line. By this time, my other friend popped his head out of his tent too, and all three of us, including my dad, were just watching the wood line, unsure what to expect. Nothing came out and we didn't hear the voice again. An hour passed and by this time my dad was sitting on a large stone next to his tent, one leg crossed and a machete in his right hand watching silently, only the sound of crackling fire echoing against the shale cliff face across the creek. Several hours passed and both my friends went back into their tents, only me and my dad were out, me tending the fire and my dad watching and waiting. I could hear rustling to our right, just beyond the light from the fire in the tree line. My friend closest to it popped his head out, looked at me and asked, what? As if he was wanting me to repeat what I said. Mind you, I didn't say a word. I hadn't said a word since I came out of my tent the first time, in fact. I put my finger up to my lips and motioned to be quiet. By the time that I did this, my dad was standing next to me and told us both to shush and... Immediately, we heard someone say, come here, in the same off-putting feminine voice as earlier. All three of us stood there, peering into the direction of where the voice come from, and shortly after, we heard what sounded like something move back deeper into the woods. It didn't sound heavy, it sounded like something sort of lightly trotting back into the woods. And that was the last time that we heard it. Shortly after, I'm assuming early morning, just before daybreak that is, the wood life returned, crickets, the distant chirp of the birds and the whisper from the wind through the leaves, everything. Once daybreak came, we all broke our tents down and we packed up and began hiking back home quick smart. We were paranoid the entire way back, stopping, listening and looking. We didn't see or hear anything or anyone. Nobody said a word on the way back, in fact. But once we made it back to my backyard, my dad broke the silence and told us that what we had just experienced never happened, and it would do us good to not say a word to anyone about it. He had fear written all over his face as if not even he had experienced something like that before. To this day, 
I really don't know what it was or perhaps who it was. I did at one point end up asking my aunt next door later in life if she'd experienced something similar since she grew up in the area too, but even she was really tight-lipped about it, saying that well, we shouldn't have gone camping out there and my dad was a fool for letting us go. I have since left my village and I've moved out of state, and I have run into similar stories down here in the southeast with the same reluctance to explain what it was or could be. I really don't know why people are so afraid to talk about it, but if any of you guys can enlighten me, then I'm really all ears at this point because I would like to know what the heck happened that night. So, a group of friends and myself rented a place on a lake for just a, a fun-filled drunken weekend. We were all in our young to mid-twenties, and it was supposed to be just a big party. For the most part, that's what it was too. The Friday night and Saturday morning, we pretty much went all out having a blast on the water and just having fun, really. Stupid stuff. And well, naturally, when Saturday afternoon rolled around... We were all so dead from going out that we decided that it would be a night of no drinking, maybe a little bit of smoking, and just kind of having a chill evening and night. But that's what it was too, relaxed. So 9pm comes rolling around and about 8 of us were inside of the house and 5 outside. The house was a two story with a second story back or sort of deck porch and it was surrounded by woods and then down through the woods you would then hit the lake. I'll mention too that we had already experienced some weird vibes from the locals when we first arrived in town, mostly just backcountry old timers that I assumed were leering and irritated because we were a bunch of college age kids looking to have a good time. But the town and the lake were large so it's not like anyone knew where we were staying. Anyways, three of my friends were on the upstairs back porch and my other friend and I, we were downstairs outside just talking on this little old table near the woods. I mean, it was otherwise just a really nice night. My friend and I were just getting lost in the conversation and all of a sudden there was this weird feeling that encompassed us. Like an unnerving physical experience that came from the woods behind us. It was so strong in fact that we both kind of quieted down and then out of nowhere this loud chanting abruptly comes from the woods. I have no idea how far away it was because of the way the lake is set up but I'm pretty sure the voice is carried up through the forest, and it sounded like a, a cult chanting away, and all of the voices were male. I mean, they were loud and perfectly in sync. I think we were frozen for all of 20 seconds before. I just couldn't contain myself, and darted towards the house with her following me. I don't know how to explain it to, the feeling that came with that chanting, but it was almost, I don't know evil like just something powerfully uninviting i was shaking by the time that we got to the second story though and ran out onto the balcony with the other three friends one of them was my brother and by the time that we got up there the chanting was gone and i naturally asked did you guys hear that and in the most shaky freaked out voices they all said that they had heard it too and not seconds later the chanting began again so, the five of us are out there, peering into the forest, listening to this chanting that would sometimes sound far away and then also sound relatively close. All male voices in the weirdest language, or I don't even know what it was to be honest. Sounded like a strange, I don't know, church or something. Then, following the chanting, a loud bang like someone hit a huge metal object sounded. And then the worst part came. A man, wailing like in extreme pain. All of my hair was up on end and it was the freakiest experience that I've ever had. My brother and I were staring at each other in a mixture of scared excitement and horror. The wailing stopped all of a sudden and then it was back to the chanting which eventually died out. I was so freaked out by it that I wanted to call the cops because whoever screamed had been in a lot of pain. That much was obvious. That, mixed with the weird chanting, just made me immediately think of some terrible sacrifice going on. 
One friend tried to say that it had to be some drunk guys just messing around singing and being weird, but no way was that coming from some drunk guys. They were perfectly in sync. Then the bang and then the wail of pain like that. And then all that weird tension and energy was just gone. No. I didn't call the cops and, to be honest, I wish that I would have, but... The forest was so large, and since the lake house was up looking down at the woods and lake as well, it really could have been anywhere. It definitely wasn't in our close proximity, but it was close enough to hear all of that perfectly. After this, though, we, we just went in and got some of the others, but by the time that they came out, the chanting had stopped. Someone wanted to go and explore and find out where it had been coming from, but obviously that was a stupid idea. After that, I was really ready to go home, and I can't explain the relief of driving away from there the next morning. Even now, it gives me the worst feeling thinking about it. Whatever it was, it felt so wrong and evil, and I'll never forget that moment. I can only imagine that it was some weird cult stuff, but maybe, maybe it was a lot worse. I was working at my first job ever in retail. I was around 20 years old. It was a busy morning, 9am, somewhere mid-December, hence why it was so busy. And I was working the checkouts as per usual, scanning items, ringing up customers and all that jazz. About an hour into my shift, I think, I was serving an elderly man who bought just a handful of items. After giving him his subtotal, uh, another guy behind him smelling of booze stretched out, handed me cash, and I kindly told him that I wasn't serving him, I was serving the man in front of him. Then I looked down and saw that he was buying some cheap knockoff branded Baileys, some booze, and of course I figured that this guy was pretty much wasted. Now, just as I was taking payment from the elderly man, I was planning in my head how I was going to tell this next guy that I can't sell alcohol to him as he's already drunk. And as this was my first job and I'd never encountered this sort of thing before, I was feeling a bit anxious. So I finished serving and now on to the drunk guy. I looked around in hopes to find another colleague or my manager perhaps, but there wasn't one in sight or available to help, so... I just sort of looked at the man and just before I opened my mouth I felt which I felt like someone grabbed a fistful of my hair and something sharp poking me in the back and of course a man whispered in my ear to which I also smelled alcohol on his breath. Serve my mate. He pushes which I'm assuming was a knife harder into my back now and then says now. In complete shock, I said nothing, just scanned the bottle, took the cash, and then they were gone. I quickly turned around to my colleague working checkouts behind me, but all they did was look at me and ask if I was okay, completely unaware of what had just happened. Then I went for a break. I, I see my manager pass by, so I rushed over to him and told him what had just happened. All he did was laugh because... He thought that I was joking, but criticized me for selling alcohol to someone under the influence. Whatever that sharp object that was in my back cut me, though, before my break, I could feel blood running down my back, and it was really sore. Of course, I couldn't see blood as my uniform is black, but I screamed, it's true, it did happen. I turned around and lifted my hair, as I have very long hair, and said, lift up my shirt, or get my female colleague to do it. This guy sliced me. But the manager just said, yuck, no, I don't want to see you lift up your shirt, and just walked away, staring into his phone. Well, I didn't return to finish my shift. I snuck out of the store, took a taxi, and went home, and my mum cleaned up my back and dressed it. And then the next morning she called work to tell them that I wasn't going to be returning as the manager's incompetence to take action when I could have almost been stabbed over a bottle was just not good enough. So this first story happened to me when I was 16 and lived in my parents' house. It was late one night in summer and 
I was in one of my two bedrooms. My brother and sister, both older than me, already lived in their own and I got one of their bedrooms for myself which sort of made me get two. In one bedroom I spent the night sleeping in my bed next to my desk and closet. The other one I would spend the day over there, sort of packed with my TV, my PlayStation, a sofa and another closet. I was watching South Park on TV around 2.30 in the morning while laying on my sofa. I always stayed up that late during the summer holidays and why I remember this so well is because of the episode of South Park that was running on MTV this night, The Losing Edge. It's my favourite episode and on that day it was quite hot in Germany and there wasn't a cloud in the sky the whole day. So, as I said, it was night time, still really hot. Hot here is like 26 degrees Celsius. But while I was watching TV, all of a sudden the temperature just dropped and I felt like cold air in my room. The next thing that I remember were faint noises from outside my room. At first I thought that one of my parents were maybe out there who were sleeping since I hadn't seen them open a door for like a couple of hours. But that wasn't it. The noise got louder and I muted my TV just to listen to the noises and to try and locate where they were coming from and they definitely came from outside of my room. So I, I got up, walked to the door and opened it. The hallway was pitch black and I couldn't see anything, except for the steps to my right which were lit up by my still running muted TV screen. Also, I, I couldn't really make out that both of my parents were asleep. That's because my parents, uh, even to this day, sleep in separate rooms because of heavy snoring. Both of them, that is. So, it definitely wasn't my parents, but what was that noise? I step into the hallway and to the right down the hallway. On the left side was the front door, and both my rooms were the first rooms to the left and right from the front door. Which meant that I needed to go deeper into the house to locate the noises. As I walked through the dark hallway, I, I could sort of make out that the noises sounded like cupboard doors opening and closing but not rapidly more like slowly and gently with the familiar clonk of wood hitting on the wood at the end but the only room in our house with cupboards was the kitchen which is in the same room as the living room and the dining room so step by step I sort of walked to the door my head to the side pushing my ear forward trying to hear the sound better the next thing that I heard was sort of like a, a rattling sound as if two plates were constantly put onto each other and I thought that maybe one of my parents must be inside the kitchen. So I took the door handle into my hand and began to turn it and all of a sudden there was just nothing. The sound stopped all of a sudden. I decided not to step into the kitchen and I turned around to walk back into my room through the still dark hallway and that's when the sound started up again. Halfway back, I turned around in the middle of the hallway and walked back to the door again, but when I got there, nothing. The sound stopped again. My heart started to race at that moment. I wasn't sure if I should open the door or not, so I waited for a full 30 seconds just to see if the sound restarted. And yeah, it did. They started again, and this time even louder and much more frantic than before. I was half scared out of my mind at this point, but I collected my courage and I opened the door. As I stepped into the kitchen and lit up the room, the sound stopped. And the strangest thing was that the kitchen was completely untouched. Everything was in its place. But I freaked when... I felt the cold air pass by me while I was still standing in the kitchen, panicky, turning around and man, that is the most terrifying moment that I've ever been through. Moments later, I could feel the hot air from the summer night again. I shut the light, closed the door and I ran back into my room. There was heavy breathing, sweating and my heart was racing like crazy. Needless to say, I wondered the whole night what the heck this incident was and didn't sleep a, not even a minute. 
The next morning, I asked my parents if they noticed anything or if they were in the kitchen after midnight at all, but they almost simultaneously said no. So then, the obvious question is, what was it? This uh, happened to me last night, and I really don't know how to explain it. For a bit of context, though, my father recently became ill, so I've moved home to help out my mother for a little while at least. I still have young siblings and a grandparent living in the house, so I decided to stay in my parents' caravan out back. They only use it in the summer, so I thought that I could get some privacy there. Now, the caravan gets cold at night, so my dad gave me an electric heater to warm it up. But my mother is very worrisome and is worried leaving it on overnight. It could start a fire and all that. So last night, I go to sleep and at around 4am, I hear banging on my window. I jump up and open the curtain and my mother was standing there. I'm not going to lie, I was a little bit worried that something had happened to my father, but she was just there to tell me to turn the heater off. I say, great, thanks for waking me up for that, then try to get some sleep. And this is where the weirdness begins. You see, just as I turn over, I begin to hear this very faint crying. At first, I thought it was someone in the house, but it was coming from the direction of the shed behind the caravan. I think to myself that it's just some fox or other animal, but it slowly starts to get louder... Not extremely loud, but loud enough that it was keeping me up. I fling the curtains open to scare whatever animal was out there, but there was no animals. Instead, I see a child-sized shadow thing sitting against the shed, its head in its knees, crying. And man, I have never jumped up so quickly in my life. I instantly turned on all the lights and ran back to the window, but when I did... It was gone, and the crying had stopped. I quickly jotted down all the features of it so I wouldn't forget, and I stayed up with the lights on all night after that. I'm scared that it's going to come back at some point. Does anybody have any info on what this could be? Like I said, it was child size. It was like a shadow. Super dark. Darker than the night, in fact. The only features that I could see was its body... And, quite honestly, I've never been so scared in my life. So, the first paranormal experience that I had was back when my age was in the single digits. Maybe around seven or eight years old. I grew up in the Midwest, Ohio to be more specific. The town or village as we grew up calling it. It was not large by any means, maybe around 40 to 50 people at most. During this time though, my family didn't have the internet or cable TV, cell phones were just starting to become mainstream, mid-90s era, and as such, entertainment was mostly chores or roaming the surrounding area, just exploring. My house was backed by fairly dense woods. There was a steep decline with a relatively flat wooded area where a creek ran through it, this creek wasn't very deep, ways deep in certain areas, but mostly near ankle deep, but it was pretty wide. Growing up, I, I practically lived in those woods, hiking up and down that creek, mapping the woods, exploring a few long abandoned and collapsed houses that nature reclaimed. I lived and breathed nature practically, and those woods were my home, my way from home. My father grew up in that area. My aunt and uncle and cousins lived just next door, and it was a pretty close-knit community. Naturally, everyone has ghost stories about their own hometown. A haunted house, a tragedy of some sort that remains a stain on its history. And my village? Well, it was no different. My father would always tell stories about ghosts or abnormal happenings that he experienced in his youth year. One thing that he would always tell me when I told him that I was going into the woods was the trees may not walk about or talk, but they do see and remember. I always thought of that as him just saying, don't be stupid out there. Now, my first encounter with the people of the woods, which is what I always called them, 
was when I was on one of my daily excursions into the wild green. It was mid-July and it was hot and humid. I stuck mostly to the creek as it was pretty cool there, and I didn't have to battle my way through the thick undergrowth as well, which was a plus. But I hiked approximately about two miles along the creek, hunting for crawdads, crawfish, and looking for signs of deer, rabbit, or the fabled albino squirrel that we had here. I kept traveling and eventually arrived at a relatively open field that had waist-high grass, and I frequently stopped here to gather wild blackberries, rest, and spook the few white-tailed deer bedded in the area. But that day, that day was different. You see, as I drew closer to the field, I noticed someone standing in the field. Instinctively, I slowed down, lowered my posture, and tried to minimize my noise. I really wasn't used to seeing someone out this far into the woods. The nearest house to that location was maybe about a mile and a half through thick undergrowth and fairly steep ravines to climb. As I hugged the bank of the creek, I moved to the edge of the open field, slowly peeking up over the tall grass to see if they were still there. But nothing. I thought that perhaps they had seen or heard me trudging through the creek and instinctively ducked down too. I wasn't about to find out though, so I turned around and headed back home, all two and a half miles back. I was more aware of my surroundings and far more cautious of my sound as I moved that time, avoiding walking in the creek to prevent the sloshing of water to give me away. As I crept through the branches jutting out into the bank of the creek, I made my way to another area that I was familiar with. A small game trail ran through here and it would cut my time and distance back home a good bit. The only downside was that it was pretty overgrown to either side and portions had thick thorn bushes. The entire time that I trekked back though, I don't know, I just felt like I was being watched. I never really felt in danger or vulnerable of being attacked or anything, but I could almost swear that I felt eyes on me. I was uneasy the entire time that I followed the game trail, routinely stopping and listening to determine if I could hear footsteps or if I was being followed at all, but still, nothing. I made it about, I would say, halfway back home when, all of a sudden, I saw in the corner of my eyes a figure standing a short distance away. But as I moved my eyes in the direction of the figure, they seemed to just sort of meld into the foliage. I thought that uh, maybe my paranoia was making me see things, so I just hurried on. A few hundred more feet in, I see again another figure, this time further away, out of my peripheral. And again, as I looked in that direction, they sort of meld back into the background. But this time, it happened twice. As I looked and that figure disappeared, another appeared again in my peripherals, closer but still a ways away. Again, the entire time, I never really felt in danger or anything. It creeped out, yes, but... I never felt like whatever there was was nefarious and intent. This continued on for the remainder of my time, making my way back home, but the more it happened, the less I felt, I don't know, afraid of the figures. Even going as far as saying out loud, I know you're there, I don't know what you want, but I'm not here to cause trouble. Eventually, I made it back to my backyard, and I turned around to face the woods to see if they were there, but... There was nothing. Now, my father was next to the shed, burning some cut grass in the backyard. I walked over to him to tell him what I had experienced, and before I could say a word, he looked at me and, with a slight grin, said, I saw you saw them too. I guess that I had the look of terror written on my face. Without even missing a beat, he put down the hoe that he was using to stoke the fire walked past me to the wood line and pulled out the can of dip that he had in his pocket. He opened it, took a pinch out, and placed it on a stone that was jutting out from the ground and walked back. I asked what he was doing and he said that he gave them an offering. He began explaining what he meant by the trees see and remember, that it was important that we respect nature whenever we enter her domain and give an offering in return when we take things from her. Otherwise, she just may not let us back out. He gave me the can of dip and said that what I saw were what he believed were spirits of Native Americans keeping watch over their former land. 
I really didn't know what they were at the time, but I just followed suit with what my dad did whenever I made my way back into the woods. I always left an offering, and although I did see them from time to time, I, I never felt like I was in any danger, and I always made sure to respect them. If they appeared in my peripherals, I would travel in the opposite direction, apologizing for any transgressions. But my cousins and many people in my village, they were all aware of their existence too, and just kind of gave them a, a wide berth whenever they appeared. I was completely oblivious to their existence, but... When I learned of them and experienced them, a whole lot of people opened up about them, about some of the history of the town and stuff like that. It was an interesting experience and it's something that I'll never forget. It definitely was creepy, but again, thankfully, uh, I never felt like I was in any danger. Growing up as a teenager, it was just me and my mum that lived together. An important part of the story is the fact that our house was in the country, about 40 miles away from the big city that we lived close to. When I started high school, I went to private school in the big city, and my mum also worked in the city too. For convenience, my mum bought a house in the city near my school and work, but we kept the country house for weekends and stuff. It's also critical to know that this country house was in some fancy pants sort of gated, secured and patrolled neighborhood. It was a two-story house and we never went upstairs. Maybe once a year when my mum would host Thanksgiving or Christmas dinner at our house. But apart from that, that was pretty much it. The upstairs was a, an informal living area, a bar, a bathroom and a game room as well. There just wasn't reason to go up there ever really. Also, the downstairs dining room and formal living room were absolutely 100% off limits. I was never allowed to walk in there or go in there unless it was a hosted dinner for like Christmas or Thanksgiving. It was kept like a, a museum, oddly. Anyway, I never really moved into the city house. I kept all of my clothes and belongings in the country house because we still had all of our animals at the country house. I would drive home every day after school to do my homework, feed the animals, watch TV, and just do stuff around the house. After my homework was done, I would pack an overnight pack of clothes for the next day at school and then drive to the city house. We did, however, spend all of our weekends back home at the country house. Now, one day, I come home after school and I'm just messing around in the house. I finish my homework and animal duties, and I go to pack my bag for the next day at school. And my dresser drawers were really messed up and things weren't really folded anymore. It looked as if someone was rummaging through my clothes, in fact. I honestly thought that I'd just messed them up last time that I was packing clothes or something. I go to leave the house, and there's a, a crystal bowl turned over upside down on one of the living room tables. Now, I'm honestly shocked I even noticed, but I did because, like I said, everything in that room was kept in museum quality. I thought it was odd, but uh, nothing really more of it. I went to the city house, and that was that. The next day, though, I'm back at the country house after school and finished my homework and animal duties again. This time, my closet seemed a bit in disarray, and at this point, I think, hang on... My mum came home in the middle of the day to see if I had drugs or something in my room, which I didn't. I wasn't into anything like that. However, when I was leaving the house, I noticed that there was a second crystal bowl turned over on one of the living room tables right next to the first one. So this definitely stood out to me and I went into the room and completely surveyed the room. Yes, for a fact, there are only two bowls turned over upside down. I sort of leave, drive to the city house and ask my mum if she went through my room. She denies it and asks, do you think someone has been in the house? I say no because, well, nothing is missing. Plus, in the back of my head, I'm thinking, it's in a gated, patrolled and secure neighborhood. How is that even possible? Anyway, the third day I go to school and a girl a year younger than me at my private high school actually lives directly across the street from the country house. On the off chance we ever stayed the night there, I always drove her to school with me. She comes up to me and says, 
We saw you leaving your driveway this morning and we flashed our lights at you, but it was foggy so I guess you didn't see. At this point, I'm definitely thinking that it's my mum going through my room because my mum and I, at the time, drove matching white Mercedes. So I'm thinking that my neighbour saw my mum's car leaving or something. I drive to the country house after school again and I walk in and immediately I see a third bowl turned over upside down in the living room chills covered my entire body at this i walk into my room bed sheets stripped pillowcases gone so many things from my bookshelves were missing it was completely ransacked i immediately ran outside of the house and called my mum and then the police when the police showed up my mum, who was driving to the house but still on the phone with me asked me to go into her bedroom closet and look under the stack of jeans on her higher shelf and there was nothing there. But it's apparently one of the three places my mum kept her jewellery. She started sobbing and she asked me to check under her underwear in the drawer. And no, no jewellery there either. She asked me to check under her winter sweaters, but no, nothing there either. She is then hysterical at this point. She asked me to check under the stove and no, there was nothing there either. That's apparently where she kept a heavy wooden box of silverware that her parents brought her from Sweden when they moved to America. Which means that everything that was of considerable value or heritage was completely gone. Every little thing. Weirdly though, the security gate had zero unauthorized visitors on the cameras and none of them were in white Mercedes or anything like that. From my neighbor's testimony, that's what her and her mum saw coming out of our driveway that one morning. The police did a full sweep of the house and identified a space in the upstairs game room where apparently someone had been living. And there were soda cans in the attic space that is access to a small door in the upstairs bar. Apparently, I had been coming home as a 16-year-old while somebody or multiple persons were living in our upstairs spaces and had been doing a full scope of the house and all the assets to steal them. To add insult to injury as well, my mother unfortunately died unexpectedly about three weeks after the robbery happened. Anything at all of value of hers or of heritage to my Swedish family was now completely gone. The insurance claim that my father had to make, who was entirely out of the picture, turned out to be $480,000. Now, the worst part is that I'm only 16 years old. And remember how my neighbor saw a white Mercedes coming out of her driveway? Well, the local police in the very small town or village that this country house was in, they tried to charge me with robbery and insurance fraud, assuming that I took all of the stuff from her house. It only lasted about two weeks, but... It was intensely brutal. I cried pretty much non-stop and it was just unending tears for me at that time. When my mother had just died. I was working with lawyers to fight my innocence against stealing valuable family assets or heirlooms. And on top of that, there was the creepy reality that I had been in the house with these people these people that had been living in this house, stealing things, and who knows what they were capable of. So I'm 29 and work as a security guard doing nights in the UK. The site that I usually do my duty at is in the northwest of England, but I won't give the name of the site or specific areas to keep my job secure. This is a bit of a long story, but I'm confident that anybody interested in this sort of stuff will be satisfied. So, I was in the army at the time when one of my closest friends landed his first job. He was always a very hardcore skeptic, but started to tell me that he was experiencing things that were weird and freaking him out sometimes. After the army, I went into a couple of random jobs whilst I got my momentum back in regular life and also got myself an SIA license. Eventually, my power got shipped off to another site for the same customer and I jumped at the opportunity to work in his place. 
But my pal Jason kindly drove me to the site for my induction to meet the guard on duty that night. The guard on duty was a very down-to-earth guy in his 50s, I guess, and after showing me the ropes, the whole five minutes, he asked me what I'd think about poltergeists. I told him briefly about some of the experiences that I've had throughout my life, and his eyes lit up, which sparked a casual friendship ever since. Basically, he told me about two guards leaving in the past due to strange things happening at this site, and that every guard has experienced at least one thing there. He's also a lot deeper into this stuff than I was, but it adds to his harmless charm, and we've shared many deep conversations about the subject. Anyway, Saturday night during the Christmas holidays in 2018, I locked myself in for the first time and ready to spend the next 12 hours alone enjoying my own company and getting paid for it. Gaming laptop straight out, albeit on whisper volume of course, and frequent heads up in case of intruders or van drivers coming to collect their personal vehicles. This place is quite creepy looking as it's out in the sticks somewhat and surrounded by farmland but I'm pretty used to cutting about in dark places similar from my time in the army, so it was just whatever to me. And for the first few shifts, I just heard the odd strange noise, which quite frankly could have been anything, from temperature expansion, contraction, to wildlife, you name it. However, on the night prior to the staff returning to work for 2019, I had one of the most profound paranormal experiences of my life which genuinely scared me. It was the 3am to 4am hourly patrol. I stepped off at about 3.30 and as I put one foot out of the guardroom door, a tiny stone whizzed around the guardroom bouncing off the metal lockers, desk, etc. and at head to torso height. I'm about six feet tall. This just didn't make any sense but I shrugged it off and continued on my way. The first part of my patrol involved walking around the back of a two-story medium-sized office building where there are lots of stone pebbles to walk on before coming out of the back of the offices and onto a relatively large car park about two-thirds the size of a football pitch. As soon as I stepped foot on the tarmac, a pebble landed next to me and to be honest, I didn't really think much of it. I could have easily kicked one up a bit with my steel toe boots and not felt it, so whatever, right? I got halfway across this car park and another landed just in front of me as if it came from behind me. This is where I started to feel things weren't quite right as the pebbles were way back by this point and I would have felt it this time due to the added force of it. I continued and at the end of the car park were a row of shipping containers on the left and a huge biffa skip on the right. The patrol route takes me walking in between these for about 30 meters and this is by far the creepiest part of the site as it's so dark and dingy there. And this is where things began to get pretty intense. So I was still walking towards this area and roughly 20 meters away when Another pebble hit the, the biffer skip loudly, about five or six feet high. In other words, I would have had to have get a bit of a run up and put effort into booting a pebble hard enough to hit it like that, high enough, and to match the force it hit with. This really startled me and I stood still and confused for about 30 seconds, looking all around myself, but there was nobody and I was equipped with a 400 lumen heavy duty torch, so... I could see for quite a distance, but there was nobody whatsoever. I sort of reluctantly carried on out of duty down the alley past the skip that had just been hit and the shipping containers to my left. I had gotten about maybe 10 meters past the first shipment when it sounded as if somebody ran up to it with a sledgehammer and just gave it a huge whack. My backside almost swallowed my pants hole at that point and it took every ounce of courage to immediately run back into the car park and shine my torch in all directions. If this was a human, due to the layout of the site, they could not have gotten away in time unless they could contest like Usain Bolt, and even that would be a stretch considering that it probably took me like two seconds to sprint there, if that. Now, the guard who gave me the induction is that interested in this stuff that he told me to call him if anything like this happens, no matter the hour. 
So I continued to the center of the car park to get a full field view of the site, but of course there was nobody. Suddenly, I just heard these bangs coming from all directions, but confined to within the site. Shortly followed by tiny stones constantly whizzing past my shins with a low trajectory, similar to how one would throw skimming stones across a body of water, I suppose. The thing is about these stones whizzing past me, though, is that the direction that they were coming from was a huge three-story high warehouse with no windows or doors from my point of view. So these tiny stones were being thrown at me from, like, an unseen force for 100% certainty as all that was there was three stories of brick wall. Never once did any of them hit me, but they just sort of whizzed by my legs left and right. Behind this warehouse is a river that gets quite choppy in the winter, but even so, the trajectory dictated that the stones were definitely being thrown from in front of me and not over the warehouse, which would be next to an impossible feat anyway. In any case, I rang the other guard and he could immediately hear the racket going on. He told me to go by the river and call out to it. Now, despite having a few experiences sparsely throughout my life, I have never been interested in engaging with whatever the phenomena is, but I decided to humor him anyway, all the while half scared to death. I called out to it though, I really can't remember what I said, and everything immediately just sort of stopped and went silent. But weirdly enough as well, nothing further happened that night, and the other guard said that he's never known anybody to get terrorized quite that badly by it. Once the staff arrived, I spoke to one of the blokes managing the site, and he said that he would check the CCTV footage for any messes. Interestingly, the next shift, a couple of days later, the cleaner who used to be around for a couple of hours after the staff leave called me into the office block to see a document printed out of an email. This was to my security firm about the events, but stated that they could not see anybody or any stones on the camera, but could see me doing an intense investigation and being violently startled a few times. Since then, I've had very sparse experiences, such as door slamming, a filled mop bucket moving like three feet from the wall in front of my eyes, plate smashing in the canteen. Very annoying, as security often gets the blame for this, understandably too. Cutlery having a quick jangle in the canteen drawer, a loud sound of what can only be described as heavy cardboard boxes being dragged along the dusty warehouse floor, and footsteps coming from the room above. A few months into the job, I also got another very close friend of mine a, a job there as well, who was also in the army prior and also a massive skeptic, until now. He literally laughed at myself and Jason whilst we gave him his induction when we mentioned the strange stuff. Jason to this day references his cocky laugh as his attitude soon got set straight, but... So, a few nights into my other friend, his name is Scott, working there, I got woken up to a phone call at around 1.30 in the morning. And, as you can probably guess, it's Scott with a trembly voice saying that somebody had just sprinted up the stairs, ran through the short corridor, and is currently stood outside the guardroom door. I said, well, you're a security guard. Do your job and see who it is. Of course, nobody was there, and nobody could be there due to the coded doors. Now, I haven't experienced anything paranormal there for a long time at this point. It seems to have... I don't know, like weeks or months of calm, followed by short bursts of activity. I've also since branched out and done all of the sites my company contracts with and never had any experience elsewhere besides one place to which I have a video evidence of that actually, but I'm reluctant to share it and even then I need permission from the guard who works at that particular site. I've even worked at a number of derelict creepy old mills with nothing strange on it, so this was definitely an experience. I do have one more story about an experience in my teens for another time, and uh, that's pretty much everything that's happened to me, but anyway, I hope you enjoyed the story, and uh, here's hoping that nothing else happens after this.
I'm a, a single male, 33, who lives alone in Denver. My apartment complex is uh, not what you would call a nice building by any means. Uh, I'm on a, a road close to Colfax Avenue, which, if you're familiar with the geography of this area, is not the safest boulevard in town. I'm a few streets away from it, but close enough that I wouldn't consider this uh, an up-and-standing or up-and-coming neighborhood. Anyway... This evening, I was watching Netflix on my couch. My two cats were cuddled up against me as I lay under a comforter. The night before, I had watched a horror movie that was scary enough to leave me in an unsettled mood, making it hard to sleep. So this night, I decided to watch a stand-up special instead, keep it light so I wouldn't have any trouble getting some shut-eye. I have classes early the next morning, so I was surprised when I made the conscious decision to turn on a second stand-up special and let myself fall asleep on the couch. I was just so comfy where I was laying and I didn't want to move, not even to turn off the several lights on throughout my apartment. Now, I remember dozing off around probably 11 o'clock. It was effortless, which meant that I was really snug under the covers with my cats flanking me on either side creating a, a tucking in feeling. I fell into a dream wherein I was uh, on an impromptu date with this guy who I didn't recognize at a blockbuster video store of all things. He bought me blue and yellow underwear, you know, like a blockbuster would sell in dreamland, insinuating that I would take the hint of his intentions. He was also desperate for a job, so when we got to the counter, he was given an off-the-cuff interview and that didn't go well. And all of a sudden, I'm just not sleeping anymore. I'm woken up by a knock at my door. Then a man's voice says, maintenance, and I just sort of sat there, sitting bolt upright on my couch. I knew something was off immediately, and I looked at my phone, which was by my left hand, and the time was 2.15 in the morning. I didn't move. The floors in my apartment are really old, and there are many creaky floorboards. I didn't want whoever this was knocking to know that somebody was actually home and awake, let alone alert to his presence. My cats got up though and ran over to the door as they normally would, but I stayed still and listened. After a few minutes with no answer, the man walked away from the door and down the hallway to the stairs. A moment after that, I heard the back door to the building swing open and closed. I have one window where I have partial view of that door, so I break my paralysis and race over to it. What I saw was an odd-looking green SUV sitting in the no-parking zone just in front of the back door. It must have been running the entire time because I didn't hear it start up and the brake lights were glowing red. Someone, presumably the maintenance man, got in the car and just drove off. Now, obviously, I don't know what his intentions really were, but no one knocks on someone's door at like 2.15 in the morning claiming to work for the landlord with good deeds in mind, right? Had it been a true emergency, wouldn't he have knocked again? Used his service key to get into the unit? What did I just avoid here? I can only assume that it was an attempted robbery at best, or maybe an abduction at worst. When I was watching the SUV drive off, I surveyed the other apartment windows. They were all dark, and I can see every unit except the two other corner apartments below me from the vantage point. I think because my apartment sort of sticks out from the building and has many windows, maybe I was targeted because my lights were visibly on and noticeable from the street or something. However, I don't know how this individual got into the building in the first place, as you would need a key to do so. I've never been so legitimately afraid as a single person living alone. I'm grateful that I installed a security chain on my door when I moved in too. I'm also really glad that, even in my disorientated state, I had the presence of mind not to move from the couch or make any noise. My nerves are definitely shot. I don't think that I'll be going back to dreamland anytime soon. I've turned off all the lights save for the lamp by my bed. I usually can't sleep with it on, but tonight... Uh, I really don't think that I'm going to be getting much sleep anyway.
So this is a story that my brother and I had driving to a friend's house in our neighbor village. The friend invited us to chill out in his apartment with a bunch of other buddies and we had nothing to do anyway so we decided to drive to him. And it was almost in the middle of the 10 kilometer distance between our two villages. I'm driving with high beam because the road is pretty dark here and not illuminated. When all of a sudden I, I saw a man standing on the street with a seemingly pretty bad head injury holding his hand in front of his eyes because my lights were blinding him. While approaching this man we then saw two other men sitting on the autumn foliage right by the road seesawing their upper bodies also with head and torso injuries. I emergency braked the car and this man standing approached us while my brother started panicking and told me that I should reverse ASAP. It really didn't feel like a normal situation, especially after a possible car accident or anything similar. It was like these guys were just sort of chilling there on purpose. But when I started reversing, he began running at us and yelled, You should drive slowly, we are here, and stuff like that. I turned the car and drove back home, shocked and confused. My brother called the police to check out what was going on with these three men, but... We never did hear anything about it after this, but whatever happened that night, it was a pretty disturbing incident. So for some background, I've been a behavioral health nurse for about 12 years now, and my first job was at a freestanding mental health facility in the south. This facility is uh, pretty uniquely constructed as it was originally a plantation owned by a wealthy Irishman who emigrated here sometime in the 1700s. The original plantation house, it's still there and is now used as the business office and the hospital itself was constructed to be attached to the house too. If you explore the campus, there's even a small graveyard with the original owner's tombstone as well as some other family members of his. Additionally, there's a sign that says something along the lines of, this is dedicated to the slaves that worked and died on this plantation. Anyway, one of the stories that has been passed down among the employees there for decades is that a young girl in the Irishman's family, one of his daughters or grandchildren, passed away on the plantation at a really young age, and that her ghost still lingers around the house and the facility, and that there are certain patient rooms that have an unusual amount of uh, paranormal activity, I guess you could call it. Now one day I was walking past one of these rooms and in my peripheral I could have swore that I saw a young girl who looked to be about 9 or 10 years old sitting on the bed. She was wearing a sort of colonial looking dress, appropriate for the time period in which she was alive that is, and looked at me directly in the eyes when I turned to look at her. I was incredibly startled and my mind raced for a few seconds trying to convince myself that she wasn't actually there. I walked a few feet past the room, gathered my courage to go back and by the time that I did, she had disappeared from sight. She didn't have any ethereal qualities or anything like that, nothing otherworldly or strange. She literally just looked like a real person sitting there in plain view. During my time there, I never really heard of anyone else who saw her, or as clearly as I did anyway. But every once in a while, one of my co-workers or a patient would experience something strange, like doors opening and slamming shut. I remember one patient in particular that ran out of his room white as a sheet and said that while he was lying in his bed, his bathroom door slammed on its own. It was so loud that I even heard it from the nurse's station myself. This patient was there for addiction and had no history of hallucinations or anything. Anyway, I just thought that I would share this because it feels good to get it off my chest. Thanks for listening. So, I decided to go hiking one day in a state park. It's a place that I'm extremely familiar with. The weather has been awful lately though, so I haven't been kayaking. My time in the state park has been spent kayaking. I was the only person out there because the weather wasn't great. I was on the orange trail, maybe two miles in, when all of a sudden I had the feeling of just being watched. 
I do have a bit of a sixth sense for this. If I feel like I'm being watched, there's an 80% chance that I am being watched. So I stopped, watched for a second. As I started back in, I suddenly saw quick paced movement out in the brush, maybe 50 yards from where I was. Something was trying to avoid being seen. Weird. I continued on though. As I walked down the trail, I continued to feel watched. When all of a sudden, as I'm walking, I hear a, a maniacal laughter out in the brush, maybe 20 yards to my left. Now, I was the only person around. I hadn't seen another person in the entire park. And this really unsettled me. I quickly moved on. I tried to put it out of my mind, thinking that I must have just imagined it. But maybe two minutes later, I hear the same maniacal laugh off to my left this time a bit closer. I decided at this that I need to pick up the pace substantially. Less than a minute later I hear the laughter right behind me and there's an enormous amount of rustling and noise coming from the brush. I realized that whatever this was was now right behind me and I just ran. I didn't look back, I just legged it. Something was telling me to run and run as far as I could Within a mile, I, I was sucking wind. I had put every ounce of energy into my escape. I, I ended up becoming too weak to run. I stopped for a rest. I didn't want to get bull rush, so I turned around, faced the direction that I'd been running from, and I took a knee. I was starting to calm down, but I still didn't feel safe, I guess. I told myself that I had to keep going. As I struggled to my feet, I, I spotted something in the brush a dark leather wrap. I unfolded it and found three extremely sharp knives in there, like butcher knives, the type of knife that you would use to, I guess, stab someone. They looked like they'd only been put there recently too. You could tell that they'd been dropped there within maybe a day or so. I let out an audible yelp when I realized what was inside the sheath. Really manly, I know, but anyway... All of a sudden, every ounce of fear came rushing back. My body was telling myself to be very, very afraid. I knew then, too, that I had to keep moving. So I jumped up and I ran back to civilization. I didn't grab the knives because I felt like it would add an immense amount of risk to an already dangerous situation. I had the feeling of being watched until maybe I was half a mile from the trailhead, Something or someone was out there, and something or someone knew that I was out there too. I'm not really scared of much. People don't really have the ability to freak me out, but the fact that my body was telling me to be really scared, to keep moving no matter what, was terrifying to me. It was nothing short of a, a primal response that I just couldn't turn off. This happened in Boston in 2013. I, uh, now 30 female, 23 at the time, was looking for an apartment with a roommate, same age. We had a pretty tight budget, so rather than using a realtor, we replied to ads on Craigslist. It wasn't my first time using Craigslist for this, and having come across my fair share of creeps, I made it a point to never go to tours alone and to make sure someone who wasn't coming with me knew the address of where I was touring. So, we scheduled an appointment to meet with someone to view a one-bedroom that was open in a three-bedroom house in Dorchester. But we get there, get inside the front door, and he told us to wait in the foyer. I like to think that I have pretty good intuition, and the place immediately felt very creepy. He said that the open bedroom is in the guest house in the backyard, but... It looked more like a garage, if I'm being honest. Then he said that his neighbor has been asking to move into the open room and he doesn't want her to know that he's letting other people tour it. So when we go to the backyard to see the guest room, we should try to walk as quickly as possible so she doesn't notice in the event that she was looking outside. All the red flags were going off. And then he told us that He'd go back there first and tell us when it's okay to head over. 
he leaves a minute or two go by and through a window we can see a few other guys that we didn't see before head to the garage obviously huge red flags at that but me and my roommate look at each other and without even having to say a word immediately leave the foyer and walk to our car we get in the car lock the doors and drive away as quickly as we can about five minutes later he calls us and asks us why we left he sounded really upset and told us that we wasted his time and blah 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 i know in my gut though that he did not have good intentions and to this day i wonder what would have happened if we went to the tour in the garage When I was nine years old, I lived in Mexico, and let's just say that it wasn't a particularly peaceful year when it came to crime. At that point, I was living with just my mum and in my childhood home up in the mountains near a forest, which, full disclosure, I absolutely loved my home since I was a big fan of nature. One night, though, I woke up from an absolutely horrible nightmare. I quickly made my way to my mum's room to wake her up because I was so panicked. After I stopped crying, I got into bed with her and as we were falling asleep, I told her that I didn't want to live in that house anymore and all my mum said was, I promise this is the last night you have to sleep in this house. And that was a haunting promise that was kept. You see, we were woken up while it was still dark by my dog barking non-stop outside. My mum got out of bed grumbling about him being so loud that early and made her way to the front door that led to the front garden where my dog was yapping away. We had an alarm system on the doors and windows so I just heard my mum deactivate it in order to check on what was going on with the dog. I was still laying in bed because I was cold and it was still too early to get out of bed. When suddenly I heard my mum scream which caused me to stand up and call for her. Not even 30 seconds later though, a man dressed fully in black and wearing a balaclava came into the room and told me to get dressed and I quickly did as I was told. They took me to the living room where two men, dressed exactly the same as the one who got me, had my mum with a, a bandage over her eyes. I just remember her begging the three men to leave us alone and telling them where her wallet and valuables were but one of them just said, that's not why we're here. They proceeded to put a pillowcase over our heads and shoved us into the trunk of our car. And after this, the rest of the events were just a, a bit fuzzy since it was hard to tell time and our sight was so limited, I, I had no idea what was going on. But I do remember they hid us somewhere in the forest, hidden between a sort of rock wall and a bed mattress, I think. I can't really say how long we were there, and I have vague memories of one of the men's backs that I caught a glimpse of when I peeked under the pillowcase. All my mother did though was pray non-stop. One, because she truly believed in God, but two, because Mexicans are extremely religious and it might dissuade them from killing a mother and child. After being moved to another location though, inside a seemingly abandoned house, they called my mum to ask for ransom. We couldn't really hear most of the conversation, but the man that we'd nicknamed the mean one felt the need to tell me that my father didn't love me and that they were going to send him a few of my fingers if they didn't pay up. Shortly, we were loaded into another car when my mum started begging one of the men to not kill us. They drove around for what felt like hours until they suddenly stopped and dragged us out and told us to get on our knees. At this point, my mother was certain that we were going to get shot, so she asked that if they did, to shoot me first in order for me not to hear my own mother die. The men said nothing, and we then abruptly heard the car peel out, and my mother just screamed at me to run as fast as I could. We ran for a few minutes and then saw a residential area where we started frantically knocking on the doors, hoping that the kidnappers didn't plan on coming back for us. To our desperation... Nobody in the first two houses opened up their door when suddenly an old man opened up at the third house and after trying to explain to him and seeing the state that we were in, he let us come in and call my father. After he picked up the phone, all I could do was cry after hearing his voice. 
He came to get us, and that night was the first and last time that I ever saw my father cry. So I work nights, and I often drive home alone around 2 or 3 in the morning. When the roads are pretty much completely deserted as well, that's when I'm usually coming home. Last night, I was driving home and got stopped at a light. There's a fairly large man crossing the street to my left with a guy in a wheelchair trailing behind him. They get to the curb, and they start waving at me and step off the curb to cross where I'm stopped. At this point, my light was turned green, and the guy walking is waving his arms in the air at me. It's a four-lane road, so I figure since he's with someone in a wheelchair that he's just wanting to make sure that I see them while they're trying to cross. So I do that acknowledgement wave and stay stopped so they can cross. Then the large guy suddenly starts drifting away from the crosswalk and seems to be walking towards my car. The guy in the wheelchair continues in the crosswalk, so I don't think much of it, until I notice that, no, it's not that this guy is just a little wobbly. He is definitely walking straight toward my door. My light is still green, so I decided that I'm just going to go before this guy gets to my door. And so I start driving, and as I'm maneuvering around this guy in the wheelchair, he gets up out of the wheelchair and starts jogging after my car. I floored it at that point and looked in my rear view to see them both just standing there looking in the direction of the car. I don't know what their real plan was, but driving to work tonight made me nervous that they'll be out there again on my way home. A couple of years back, I was coming home from a gig in Cambridge, England, and I didn't have enough fuel to get home. So, of course, I pull into a petrol station. I'm pressing the pump, but getting no response from the shop and can't see an assistant, on the other side of the window, that is. It's 2am at this point, so the shop isn't open. You have to pay through the hole in the window, etc, etc. And anyway, I'm standing there like a lemon and nothing's happening, so I approach the night window and bang on it. Still, nothing. Nobody home. But just then I hear a shuffle behind me and a sort of deranged breathy giggle. As I spin around, there he is. The strangest, most peculiar looking, I don't even know what, that I've ever seen. A wide-eyed, scruffy hooded man on all fours in a crawl position, head cocked up, glaring at me with a menacing, snarling, saliva-laced grin. I sort of back away slowly, just assessing the situation. Is he just a complete nutter that's escaped from an asylum or something? Or is he sinister? A hole that gets a thrill out of scaring people or something. As I back away, he slowly moves sideways whilst giggling and wheezing at the same time, all dribble around his mouth and chin. Our glares are locked on each other and I'm preparing to run up and boot him in the chops, and just then, the shop attendant appears from hiding under the counter and puts a sign against the window saying, Police have been called. This is enough to get the lunatic's attention, and he slowly rises to a haunched standing position and just stares, still smiling at the window in makeshift sign. This gives me enough time to run and jump into my motor. I get in and I lock all the doors but stick around as I just wouldn't forgive myself if the guy got hurt or something. The guy inside, that is. And even though the nut job was locked out, you never really know, right? The freak didn't move a muscle for what seemed like three minutes or so, but then sirens in the distance snapped him out of it quick smart. He lifts his head to shout and swear towards the sky, then runs off into the trees behind the petrol station. At this point, I've had enough and I exit for home. The adrenaline lasted hours, but I managed to drive okay, and all was fine in the end. And I know that he was just a man in a hoodie acting like a, a total loon, probably high on something. But, man, that was one of the creepiest things that I've ever experienced. So 
So we've been going to a local pool for six plus weeks for swimming lessons. This was the last week and as soon as I had my son, 16 months, dressed, an old, I would say 70 year old plus maybe, lady walked in. She immediately, almost before turning the corner, said, how old is he? Now, I love showing off my baby boy, but she was immediately creeping me out. She was standing less than like one and a half feet from my face and I couldn't back up as I was in a corner. She began asking in a sort of monotone and low voice all kinds of questions about him and how old he was. I answered vaguely and only gave as much info as I'd give any other stranger, his age and name. She then asked me again when he was born and I said August. She then said, I'm born in February, my mum in October, my dad in July, my brother in December. She listed another brother and some grandkids as well but I was now frozen as those are the exact same birth months as my family, down to the family member. She continued to ask the same questions and tell me the same info over and over. At one point, looking at my son and then me and says in a really dull and creepy voice, I'm sorry, with a huge pause in between, I just want to take him and go. I don't respond to this. At this point, I was starting to get my son's clothes wet because I'm in my bathing suit holding him freshly dressed, so I'm getting a little antsy and also freaked out. She looks at me and says in her monotone, slightly annoyed voice, I'm bothering you, aren't I? I start to say, no, I, I just need to get dressed, and she cuts me off and begins to ask about my son's eye color. I start to say that they're blue and she again cuts me off and asks what color mine are. I then again start to say blue and she reaches to my face and uses her fingers to open up my eye, then agrees that they're blue and looks back at my son. She doesn't touch him, thankfully, but says, they're blue, just be happy that they're not black, and gives a really monotone laugh. All in all, she made me extremely uncomfortable. My son wasn't in any danger, I think, and I'm the most passive person in the world. I wasn't really sure what to make of her at the time, so I remained as friendly as possible, but stopped adding anything to the conversation after she rattled off her family's birthdays that are the exact same as my family's. I really don't know what to make of any of this. Do you guys? This happened almost 25 years ago, way before cell phones were a thing. When I was 17, my brother, 13 at the time, and I were traveling in northern British Columbia in mid-November. This is important as the darkness at this time of year in the mountains is pretty much absolute. We were in the Pine Pass, and anyone who knows this area knows how desolate it is. I'm talking hundreds of kilometers between gas stations and any kind of people or buildings or anything. We were just about at the Powder King ski resort turn off and it was getting late. We pulled into a roadside turnout around maybe 10 or 10.30 because I was super tired. My brother was already sleeping so I pull in and park near some tourist signage, lock my doors and put my seat back up to sleep. I'm pretty much dead asleep when something just snapped me awake. To this day, I'm really not sure what it was that woke me up, but I was looking around trying to figure out what was happening when all of a sudden my car was surrounded by four or five men. They started yanking at the door handles trying to get in the car. I'm not sure if they saw that I was awake or not, but I quickly sat up and slammed the car in drive and peeled out of there quick smart. I'm not sure if I hit one of them or not, and to be honest, I didn't care to check. I didn't stop again until my auntie's house in Prince George. It was one of the most terrifying times of my life to be out there in the middle of nowhere, so exposed and to be taken advantage of like that. So it was 2016 and me, 22, and my husband, 28, were moving to a, a rental home. 
I was six months pregnant, and we were thrilled to move into a nice community since we had lived in a pretty sketchy part of town. We didn't know much about this rental except that it was in a good school district, low crime area, within our budget. Time passes without any problems, and soon our son is born. His birth was pretty much textbook, and he slept well in the hospital. But this all changed when we brought him home. The first night home was just absolutely awful. Every time we set him in his crib, he screamed. I'm not talking a normal I'm hungry or need a new diaper cry. A legitimate scream like he was in pain. My husband and I had to take shifts at night so the one could be with him and the other could sleep. My shift was always second and started around 2 or 3 in the morning. I tried my best to sleep, but shortly after my son's birth, I began having these just horrible nightmares. I would dream nightly about my son being hurt or needing me, and I just couldn't get to him. At my six-week checkup, I told my OBGYN, and she believed that I was having postpartum anxiety, and even prescribed me medicine and recommended that I see a counselor. Weeks passed by since starting the medicine and counseling, and... I was still having nightmares, and my son was still screaming all night long. His pediatrician told us that it was colic and that he just needed to wait it out. Everything changed, though, when he turned three months old. His screaming continued, but started to be all day instead of just at night. My nightmares became much more specific. One night, I dreamed that I walked into my son's room and he was on fire and screaming. Though I was in his room, my feet were stuck inside his doorway. I couldn't move or speak. I could only watch my son screaming in pain. I woke up from that dream, screaming and hyperventilating. My husband ran into our room and tried to console me. The next few days, I, I just couldn't sleep. I spent most of my days at work and my evenings sitting on my front porch talking to my next-door neighbor. She was a, a really sweet old lady who had lived in this neighborhood since it was originally built in the 70s. And uh, I guess that she could tell something was wrong and asked if I was okay. Reluctantly, I told her how my baby had been acting and how I was having these horrible nightmares. She was sympathetic and asked me to elaborate. I didn't feel comfortable telling her the details, so... I just told her that I had dreams about fires in the house. Her face quickly changed though from caring and concerned to horrified. Seconds of quiet felt like hours before she spoke again. Do, do you know what happened at this house? She said. I told her no. She sighed and looked down before grabbing my hands and looking at me. She goes on to tell me that a, a few years ago there was a, a fire in the house due to some faulty wiring done poorly by the landlord or something. There was a young family with a three-month-old baby living there, and unfortunately, the baby passed away in the fire. She said the couple moved away and the house was renovated and put up for rent after. And after hearing that, I was in complete shock. I ran inside to my husband holding our baby and told him that we needed to leave. He must have seen the fear in my eyes since he did not even ask me to explain myself until we had gotten into the car. I explained what happened in the house and how I felt like my dreams were warnings that we needed to leave before something happened to our kid. Luckily, my brother-in-law lived in the next town over, so we went there. The first night we stayed in his house, our son slept all through the night. Not a single peep. In fact, I checked on him every hour since it was so unusual for him to sleep this well. From then on, apart from my normal baby stuff, my son never screamed again like he did in that house. My husband packed our stuff and we stayed with my brother-in-law until we were able to get our own lease somewhere else and rent a new place. I never went back. I never will go back. I just pray for whoever moved in there next that they're okay.